น่าจะโอเคเจอไปทีนี้ yes we can so I'm wearing two masks because the uh, the dust whatever dust is in here I can it's coming through the mask and making it pop so I'm gonna have two masks on so I hope everybody can understand what I'm saying you're gonna probably have to speak up because I don't know that they can are you talking see they can't even hear me <laughs> can you give me a second yeah you are muffled So I guess I should take off my mask. Or just speak up. Okay. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yeah. But yes. Barely. Can you hear me now? Okay. So I'm hoping that uh I don't have a coughing spell. I can literally feel the dust enter the back of my throat. So I I have two masks. So if I pause and step out to cough, that's because I can feel that dust in the back of my throat. Okay. So I apologize in advance. All right. So uh, let's see. I can share my screen. <laughs> okay, guys. So uh, <clears throat> my name is Katarina White. I'm one of the unit-based educators here at Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center. I cover. Uh, you can't hear in the back. You can't hear in the back. Okay. I'm gonna put it at the top loud. I guess I'm going to have to talk loud. I cover 12 Tower and 25 Tower, uh, 12 Tower Medical Telemetry and 25 Tower Transplant. So I typically help Shailene and Heather out with the uh, onboarding for the ECG class. So I'm here to uh, go over the ECG uh, fundamentals uh, class with you. My name is here uh, displayed, Katarina White, as you can see. And this is my email address. I'm available via Tiger Connect text from 8 to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. So if you have some questions or you just don't feel easy about some of the questions that you uh, that you that we go over today, you can always feel free to contact me. Now, if you contact me at midnight, I'm not going to respond. I've had some people to contact me at midnight. So please do not contact me at midnight, okay? If you can, try to contact me earliest the next day. If you have a question about a particular strip or a uh, rhythm that you've done with your practice test, you can always take a picture of that and Tiger text it to me and I can kind of give you some instant feedback, okay? All right. So I'm just going to pull up uh, one of the uh, uh, some of the things that we're going to talk about today. Just give me a second. Okay, I'm going to share the screen with you guys so we can talk about uh what you should expect for this test. I believe Shailene and Heather uh, provided you with a copy of this so that you will be able to look at it and uh, kind of get an idea of how you should prepare. So uh, they used to call this exam prophecy, but it's now called Relias. So this is just basically uh, what you should be focused on uh, as you prepare for the test. Um, 
first order of business, there are no premature junctional contractions on this test. So if you see that in your answer choice, yes, ma'am. You can barely hear me. Can you all hear me now? I try to uh, turn off the volume on these speakers. No? So I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to uh, not be on camera, but I'm going to stand up in front of the class so that I can speak. That, that way they can hear me. And I'm hoping that the other group can hear me as well. All right, so I'm going to try to stand up and discuss this with you guys, and I hope this uh, helps. Can you hear me now that I'm standing? Yeah. All right. All right. It's, um, <clears throat> can you go next door and hear, see if you can hear me at that point? Okay, in the room next door, can you guys hear me as I'm speaking? They can hear you. Okay, great. Okay. All right. So let me go over this study um this study focus. There are no premature junctional contractions on the test. If you see premature junctional contractions in your answer choice, do not choose that. There are no status a written on this test. If you see that in your answer choice, do not choose that. There's a 60 page study packet, and I'm going to kind of briefly go through that with you guys in a second, just to show you exactly how you should be studying from those specific pages. Okay. Uh, you'll be tested over main categories, which will be four. They'll test you over heart rate, PR interval, QRS duration, and rhythm interpretation. There are two different versions of this test. The first version that you will receive will be version A. Version A uh, consists of 57 minutes, 57 questions. 83% is passing for version A. You can only miss nine questions. Nine questions. Okay. Version B, which is the quarter of the exam, 52 minutes, 52 questions. 81% is passing, but you can only miss nine questions for version B. Okay. So that's essentially one minute per question. There are no calibers on the test. Use the zoom in feature that is built into the, to the exam. You can zoom in and look at your PR intervals and your QRS durations. Uh, also, you can use your computer calculator or your calculator that's provided to you by your exam proctor. But most of you guys are probably, uh, will probably be testing uh, via Zoom. I'm not sure if you're going to be testing it in, in person. So just be careful with your phone. Uh, in the past, we had some individuals that were using their phone to reach out and phone a friend for information. Okay, so. Uh, if you're caught cheating, you know, you take that pretty seriously. You have to be careful with that. So if you do have a calculator that you can, can have at your disposal when you're getting ready to take the test, that's probably the best um, thing to do. Okay. Any questions about this before we move on to the next topic that we're going to discuss? Yes, ma'am. So we'll either get version A or version B. Your first attempt is always going to be version A. Your second attempt will always be version B. If you hit the third attempt, you'll, you'll flip back to version A. And then there are no fourth attempts. Okay. If they discuss with you guys about the policy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so you get three attempts to take the exam. 
So that's why I kind of get, uh, gave you guys my contact information. So uh, if you if you have questions while you're studying or you just don't don't feel right about something, type it check me. Uh, please download the app so that I can uh, be able to communicate with you uh, quickly about uh, any questions that you may have regarding the, the uh, any particular stuff. Okay. All right. So I'm going to move on to the next um, next page. <clears throat> okay. So this is the uh, part of this is a part of the 60 page study packet. So I'm going to just scroll down to what we're going to be discussing. And then we'll 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 just try to uh, make sense out of uh, what's important. <laughs> so I hope you guys can hear me. This I kind of wrote the details about this. I'm pointing right here between the PR interval and QRS duration. Okay, so this is important because a lot of people, uh, they confuse exactly where to begin your PR interval and where to end your PR interval. So this in your study paper, I can bring you to exactly what page you need. You should have that challenge already provided you that. You're gonna constantly refer to this and this. That's gonna help guide you on how to measure. Okay. That is, uh, so you should have that 60 page study packet. Okay. And uh, it's, uh, I want to say it's page four or five. Okay. She, 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 sent it, she sent it to you in the email. You may not have time to go through that right now. I'm just going to sh show you what's in this, uh, what it, what's important and what you need to know. Okay, hey, on this one, this one is important because a lot of people uh, kind of forget the uh, small box. Uh, small box is 0 0.04, and this is just a refresher. We're gonna go through the whole entire PowerPoint uh, that's called Fundamentals of uh, ECG. We're gonna go through that. <clears throat> but first I want to just kind of give you an idea of this study packet. Then we have here 0 0.20, which is a large squares that are defined by dark lines and are five small squares high by five, five small squares long. Okay. All right. So next, we're going to get right into talking about uh, what's going to be on the test. Okay. So you see this page? There's one question. That is the extra is on the test. And what I have written in red is the answer. The answer is normal sinus rhythm. So I do receive a lot of people that come to me for remediation that miss everything that's in this packet. And I ask, did you study? After I've done this class, I studied. This is extra, is on the test. Next page. <clears throat> This is the most missed question on the test. There are three questions that come from this. And you'll see number two, where it says heart rate 50 beats per minute. That is an answer. Number four, where it says PR interval 0 0.20. That is an answer. And number, uh, actually the interpretation, sinus bradycardia. Those are your three questions that come from this strip. This is the one question 
that makes or breaks people from making an 83%. They'll miss all three and then they didn't pass and they come to me, well, I didn't pass. Did you study? Yes. Did you study the, that packet where I told you the questions come directly from that packet? Well, I briefly looked over it. They give you three attempts. If you don't do anything else, get this question right. Three questions from that one strip. Here we have sinus tachycardia. Pretty self-explanatory, one strip from that. Sinus arrhythmia is not on the test. Here we have normal sinus rhythm with PACs. One question that's going to be on the test. On this one, we have, uh, so on version A, there are three A fields with rapid ventricular response. Version B, there are two A fields with rapid ventricular response and one A field. So this particular strip, <clears throat> excuse me, and that question, there's only going to be one question from this particular strip, and that's on version B, and that's A field. But we'll go a little bit more in detail about A field with RBR so that you can have a, a clear idea of the difference between the two. Okay. Here, there's one question atrial flutter. Here we have uh, atrial tachycardia. Uh, there are two questions that come from this strip. The first one is the heart rate of 190 beats per minute. And then the second one is atrial tachycardia. And just a, a little tip, uh, they did change some of the terminology on this test. Uh, instead of them calling it atrial tachycardia or SVT, what we typically hear, uh, they threw in a name that I have never heard of. I had to do a Google search to find it. Atrial ventricular nodal reentry tachycardia. <laughs> so if you don't remember anything else, remember that. That was one of the terms that was used uh, by the person who invented the 12 lead ECG and the, the five lead telemetry, Dr. Antoven. He's a Swiss uh, electrophysiologist. He first term that when he uh, uh, was writing this, coming up with all these ideas, that he won a Nobel, uh, not a Peace Prize, but he won a Nobel uh, for his uh, for the science that he created regarding this. And we still use this today. So here we have two questions that come from this, heart rate 52 beats per minute and junctional rhythm, okay? not on the test. Here we have one question that comes from this, accelerated junctional rhythm. This one is another one that's most missed on the test. This is junctional tachycardia. A lot of people think that is a T wave, you know, P wave, but that's actually a T wave. And this is no P wave. So if you don't do anything else, if you could Remember that that is junctional tachycardia. A good uh, thing that may be helpful for you guys is to maybe purchase some uh, flashcards. I know you're going to be taking your test pretty quickly. You can print this out and start making some flashcards and start testing yourself so you can be prepared for your test. Here we have another one that's a most missed question here. Most missed question. Um, we have PR interval that is 0 0.16. And then uh, on this particular strip, uh, sinus uh, tachycardia with rare PVC. Here we have one question for this one, uh, ventricular tachycardia. This one, one question, VFib. One question, idioventricular rhythm. Two questions, asystole. On version A, they give you the same strip twice and it's the same answer twice. So if you don't do anything else, answer that the same way twice. Some people like myself, I answered asystole and I thought to myself, there's no way they would give this to me twice. So I chose be filled. 
and I got it wrong. Because I'm like, they wouldn't do that. They did. So you had two opportunities <laughs> to get this one right, okay? Okay. All right. Okay, here we are. Uh, this particular strip, normal sinus rhythm with first degree horn block. So you'll see that. The same exact strip, second degree horn block type one. The same exact strip, second degree horn block type two. Third degree horn block. And let's talk about this. Everybody misses this on the test. These are the same exact strips that's on the test. And no one ever gets them. So many people come to me and it was like, well, I just didn't understand. The easiest way that I can explain this to you is this. You see that line right there, that first line? It's right before a P wave. So anytime you see a spike right before a P wave, I want you to think P equals atrial, okay? Then you see that second spike, you barely can see it, but it's coming right before your QRS. If you have a spike right before your QRS, I want you to think ventricle. There are two spikes in this. This is atrial ventricular pacing. Just keep it simple. You just need to pass the test. They're not asking you if it's failure to, to, to uh, admit, yeah, we're not worried about all that initiation with a pacemaker if it's failing and all that stuff. Simply AV paste. So when you see it on the test, and I want you to remember Katarina told me if I see two spikes, that's AV paste. Keep it simple. So here we have our next um, strip. This particular strip is, uh, you see that there's no P wave. Here we have a spike, one spike, and it's right before your QRS. So this is your QRS, and that's a T wave. So this is simply ventricular pacing. So if you see one spike, choose ventricular pacing. Okay, any questions about the uh, ventricular pacing, AV pace? It's pretty self-explanatory. Okay. All right. So we're gonna start talking about this EKG exam tip sheet. And we, we, will, we, we will, when we get ready to practice, we will uh, use this tip sheet together. And I just kind of want to explain to you um, the thought process behind this. And so that you can make sure that as you take your test, you're utilizing this tool to uh, prepare uh, for your test and actually uh, use this when you're taking your test. When you prepare to take your test, you can have two scratch sheets of paper. One of your scratch sheets of paper will be for you to uh, write down all these tips from memory, from memory. Now, if you go in there, you take that tip sheet to the test with you, that's cheating. But if you write it down from memory, that's not cheating. Your second scratch sheet of paper will be for you to use that to uh, with your measurements. You're gonna be measuring your PR intervals, your QRS durations and all that good stuff. So that's why you're going to need those two scratch sheets of paper. Now let's talk about uh, the first, second, the two of the seconds and the third degree hard block. With our first degree hard block, I just kind of keep, kept it simple so that you'll be able to determine and decipher between the rest. First degree hard block is the only block that does not have any drop QRS. You'll see that it has a prolonged PR interval that's greater than 0 0.20. And it's pretty consistent. So that means that when you're measuring your PR interval, if you have seven boxes, each box should have seven boxes. And there is no drop QRS. It's pretty simple. Second degree hard block type one, your PRI lengthens and is not consistent. And you have dropped QRS. Second degree hard block type two, the PRI is consistent and does not lengthen and you have dropped QRSs. Uh, with third degree hard block, that's a medical emergency. What I can tell you about that is there is no relationship between your uh, P's and QRSs. And what you'll see that there's, dropped, there's a dropped QRS. And what I've noticed on this test, 
that all of the third degree heart blocks, pretty much the heart rate was uh, less than 50 beats per minute. People were in, caught between second degree heart block type one and third degree heart block. So if you ever get into that situation and you see that the heart rate is less than 50, I want you to go ahead and choose third degree heart block. Okay. Any questions about the block so far, but we're gonna practice and get you comfortable with it. All right. So the next one uh, on here is sinus tachycardia. So sinus tachycardia, your heart rate is usually between 100 to 150. You'll have an order art interval that's regular. And as you see, the next one we have, supraventricular tachycardia, also known as atrial tachycardia, also known as atrial ventricular nodal reentry tachycardia. The heart rate is between 150 to 350. You have an order or interval that's regular, but let me tell you how to decipher between the two. If you have a heart rate that's 150, you're gonna go with sinus tach. In the, in the event that that heart rate gets 151 and above, then you're gonna go with supraventricular tachycardia. Now this criteria, this, the range comes directly from all, I've looked in all the textbooks, I looked at the 60 page study package. That's the range that they give you. So I didn't make this up, but the, the minute that heart rate gets at 151, then it's a possibility that that could be uh, considered SVT. Okay. So on your next one, you have a field with RBR, which is also known as a rapid ventricular response. And I kind of put a little asterisk mark and made that font a little bit bigger. You see the order R interval is irregular with this one. Uh, AFib with a, it's going to be a ventricular rate of more than 100 to 180 beats per minute. In the study packet that they gave you with prophecy, they didn't really even touch on AFib with RBR, but version A has three AFib with RBRs on the test. So I looked at uh, all the literature and 100 to 180 is pretty much what the, the range that they go by. So what that means, if it's AFib, if the heart rate is 100 on the dot, that's AFib. The minute it goes above 101 and above, that's A field with RBR. Any qu questions about the A field with RBR? We'll do more practice to kind of get you comfortable with it. So uh, lastly, we have the two most confused rhythms of all, junctional rhythm category and idioventricular rhythm category. A lot of people get those mixed up. So with junctional rhythm, you have R to R interval that's regular. Idioventricular, the order R interval is regular. So, uh, but the key points to remember here with junctional, you have a, a, you may not have a P wave or it could be inverted. And the QRS is usually uh, 0.12 or less. On the test, all the junctional rhythms that I saw on the test, they were just pretty much absent P waves. I didn't see any inverted. So that'll help you out a lot as you go through testing. With the idioventricular rhythms, uh, you'll see that there is no P wave and the QRS is more than 0.12. So once you have decided what the QRS look, whether it's 0.12 or above or less than 0.12, then you can make a decision to be in the right category. So let's go back to junctional rhythm. So you'll see with junctional rhythm, you have a heart rate of 40 to 60 beats per minute. If the heart rate is 60 on the dot, that's junctional rhythm. When it goes to 61 and above, then you accelerate it junctional. Okay. So accelerated junctional, if you have a heart rate that, that is 100, that's accelerated junctional. The minute it goes above 101, then you're into the junctional tachycardia category. So I want you to remember on the test, I think it's a couple of the accelerated junctionals, the heart rate is 100 on the dot. And you have answer choices that say accelerated junctional or junctional tag. Everybody's choosing junctional tag. So just remember, heart rate 100 on the dot, that's accelerated, uh, accelerated uh, junctional. With junctional tag, you have a heart rate of 100 to 150 beats per minute. So the minute it's above 101, then you can say that's in the junctional tachycardia category. So I want you guys to put a little star by these four uh, rhythms. Put a star by sinus tachycardia. Well, you can't put a star, but make a mental note. Uh, sinus tachycardia, uh, SVT, A field with RVR, and junctional tach. So going back to looking at sinus tach, look at the heart rate, 100 to 150. Look at the heart rate for junctional tachycardia, 100 to 150. The difference between 
sinus tech and junctional tech comes down to a P wave. That's what it comes down to, a P wave. And that's what gets a lot of people. So if you don't see a P wave, it's most likely junctional tech cardio. But if you see a P wave, that's sinus tech. Okay. Um, with the SVT, you have a heart rate of 150 to 350. But with junctional tech, heart rate is 100 to 150. So just remember that junctional tech, the heart rate cuts off at 150. But a lot of people mix these two together. On the test, they like to put SVT, junctional tech, and SVT, you know what I mean, or sinus tech, all in the same answer choice. And that confuses people. Okay. Uh, with the uh, A field with RVR, heart rate is between 100 to 180. And a lot of people get that mixed with junctional tech. The difference between A field with RVR and junctional tech comes down to whether that R to R interval is regular. A field is always going to be irregular. Yes, ma'am. I was going to have to say the R to R interval is regular. The R to R, R, to R interval is regular with junctional tachycardia. Okay. With A field with RVR, you have a, a irregular uh, R to R interval. Yeah. Yeah, that's the difference. So, uh, any more questions before we move down to idioventricular? Okay. So, idioventricular rhythm, um, if you have a heart rate of 50, that's idioventricular rhythm. Heart rate above 50, that's accelerated idioventricular rhythm. And I think all the questions that's idioventricular on the test, they have the heart rate right at 50, but people will choose accelerated idioventricular. So, don't fall into that trap. Okay. So, uh, this was just a pre-warm up to the to the uh, PowerPoint presentation that we're getting ready to go through. But any questions before we move to the PowerPoint presentation? Okay, all right. So give me just a second. Okay, so hopefully everyone has out their uh, PowerPoint presentation this, uh, that says ECG fundamentals. We're going to kind of just go through the basics of ECG. 
Uh, as we go through this, I will tell you, there are some uh, rhythms or strips that's built within this PowerPoint presentation. And some of those strips are actually on the test. So if I say that this particular strip is on the test, put something to highlight that so that you'll know to study that as you uh, study, okay? Give me just a second. I'm not used to teaching like this, so I'm just bear with me. All right. Okay. So here are our, here are the objectives. We're going to at the end of this lecture, you will be able to describe how an impulse is conducted through the electrical system of the heart. You will be able to identify the waves produced on the ECG during a normal cardiac cycle. You will be able to analyze and interpret rhythm strips. You will be able to measure the rate, the PR interval, and the QRS complex. So this is basically an overview of the heart function. Uh, pretty sure you guys probably learned that in nursing school. Do you feel like you need to look at the video? No? Okay, we're going to bypass that. I'm going to move on to the next page. Okay, so why do uh, I need an EKG? So basically an EKG takes a look at a person's electrical heart function from different angles. An echo takes a look at a person's mechanical heart function. So that's just the basics between that. And this is just showing you the limb lead views and all that good stuff. So basic versus advanced EKG rhythm interpretation. Um, so with a basic EKG, it's just basically showing you the basic rhythms that we see every day. But if there's something like a STEMI or a VTAC or VFIL and we want further analysis, we'll do an advanced EKG rhythm interpretation, which we'll do a 12 week EKG. So that's just the difference between the two. Nothing that you're gonna be tested over, just the basic fundamentals. Typical lead placements. Um, so this is just saying that proper lead placement is critical to a uh, proper interpretation of EKG rhythms, which is true because we had a patient uh, who uh, they someone misinterpreted what was going on with them. And we, just, we found out that the, that the staff really didn't know how to place these leads. So I did some education with that and that kind of resolved it. So, um, but that's how, uh, that's where your lead placement will go. Well, uh, five lead telemetry. So why do we typically look at lead two and V1? So uh, lead two follows the sinus pathway. V1 looks at the septum and helps detect bundle branch blocks. So that's why we, you'll see a lot of people looking at V1 and lead two. And if you work in CCU, uh, uh, they'll have different set of, uh, leads they look at so that they can make sure that they can uh, observe STEMIs and stuff like that. Rule of electrical flow. So you have your right arm that has a negative electrode. And if electricity flows toward the positive electrode, the pattern produced on the graph paper will be upright. <coughs> With the positive electrode, the left leg, uh, if the electro electricity flows toward the negative electrode, the pattern produced on the graph will be inverted. So you'll see, as we practice, you'll see a lot of strips where some things may be upright and some may be inverted. This is uh, the electrical conduction system of the heart. You see that there? Uh, it is important to understand that the relationship relationship between the electrical system of the heart and what we can see on the cardiac monitor. So you really need to understand the basic fundamentals of ECG. You really need to make sure you understand the basic fundamentals of ECG uh, as you're on the unit 
trying to uh, interpret your strips, whether or not to call a doctor, uh, if you need to get a 12 week ECG. So you need to have some basic understanding of all that. Intrinsic impulse rate conduction. So with supraventricular atrial, your SA node is between 60 to 100 beats per minute. The AV node is 40 to 60 beats per minute. With ventricular, you have a right and left bundle branches that's between 40 to 50 beats per minute and Purkinje fibers that's 20 to 40 beats per minute. The heart is supplied with an electrical conduction system that generates and conducts electrical impulses along, along specialized pathways to the atrial and ventricles, causing them to contract. So this is some basic EKG vocabulary. So you'll hear a lot of this if you haven't, you know, don't, if you're not strong in EKG. Wave, uh, that is a positive or negative deflection from baseline that indicates a specific electrical event. You'll hear say P wave, Q wave, R wave, S wave, and T wave. Okay, and today you'll hear me say a lot, P wave. You'll probably get tired of that. <laughs> Interval, that's the time between two specific ECG events. You'll hear PR interval, and I say PR interval a lot. Uh, QRS interval is also called QRS duration. So you'll hear me use those interchangeably. They mean the same. Okay. Uh, QT interval and, P and R to R interval. So you won't hear me say anything about QT interval, but you will hear me talk a lot about R to R interval, okay? Uh, segment, the link between two specific points on an ECG that are supposed to be at the baseline amplitude, not negative or po positive. You may hear PR segment, ST segment. Complex, that's the combination of multiple waves grouped together. The only main complex on an ECG is the QRS complex. Okay, any questions before we move on to the next page? Okay. Depolarization and repolarization. Depolarization, uh, the heart receives electrical impulse. It's caused by positive sodium and calcium ions going into the cell. Repolarization, you'll see resting phase of cardiac cycle. It's caused by positive potassium ions moving out of the cell. Depolarization equals contraction and repolarization equals relaxation. Sinoatrial node, also known as the SA node. The sinoatrial node is referred to as the pacemaker of the heart. The SA node is located in the wall of the right atrium at the junction with the superior vena cava. Specialized electrical cells called pacemaker cells in the SA node discharge impulses at a rate of 60 to 100 beats per minute. So here we have P waves. Uh, impulses that begin at the SA node are demonstrated on the ECG as the P wave. A P wave equals atrial depolarization and contraction. So if you can, uh, make a special note on this page so that you could go back and really, really refer to your P wave morphology. Because a lot of people get confused about what a P wave looks like and uh, that's what kind of messes up, up, them up on the test. So you'll see the first one is a normal, normal P wave. This is what a normal P wave looks like. This one is notched. So notched P waves, uh, that's, the strip that I showed you in that 60 page study packet, where the, I said it was the most missed question on test, three, three questions, that particular strip had a notch P wave. And so when people would try to measure where the PR interval start and begin, they would start here in the second little notch right here, in the middle of that notch. They'll start there and end it there. But technically you should be starting it right here, right before that first notch and then ending it right there. And if you count in between these lines, that's one, two, three, four. And if you multiply four times 0 0.04, that's 0 0.16. So a lot of people had some confusion as to where to, to measure because they saw an abnormal P wave. Here we have inverted. 
You can't no. All right, sorry about that, guys. I didn't realize I wasn't sharing. Sorry. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go back and talk about this first P wave. That's a normal P wave. The second one is a NOSH P wave. Um, I mentioned earlier that some people uh, get confused as to where to measure the PR interval. I had uh, people tell me they start measuring this notched P wave right in the middle of where it's notched, and they'll end it right there. But for this, you would start it right here on this line and end it right there. And if you count the number of small boxes, one, two, three, four, and multiply that times 0 0.04, that's 0.16, you have a peaked P wave here. You're going to hash a mark right before it peaks and end it right there. So you'll count one, two, three, three times 0 0.04 is 0 0.12, just to kind of give you an idea of how to measure these abnormal P waves because it looks not normal. Then you have it inverted. With this one, you'll start right here before it inverts, and then you'll end right there. So you'll count one, two, three, four. Four times 0 0.04 is 0 0.16. So that's just to kind of give you an idea. You're gonna have some abnormal P wave morphology. And it throws people off when they see stuff that's not normal and they don't know how to look at it. You have a guide that shows you how to measure your PR interval, but that guide doesn't show you how to measure things when the morphology changes, okay? So this is just kind of give you an idea of how you should measure if you see inverted peaked or notch P waves. <clears throat> any, any questions? Yes, ma'am. What were the last one again, how to measure that one? Okay, so mm -hmm. on the last one here, inverted, You'll see here, so I would come here and hash a mark right there on that line, right before it inverts. And then I'll put a line right there. In between that, I'm gonna count my boxes. One, two, three, four. And four times 0 0.04 is 0 0.16. So that's how I would measure that because that's an inverted P wave. It looks different from my normal P wave. I'm used to measuring normal. But when, when the P wave morphology changes, you know, a lot of people kind of get, you know, anxiety about that and they don't know where to measure. But we'll try to practice today and give you a lot of feedback today. Okay. All right. Atrial ventricular AV node. So um, the AV node is located in the wall of the right atrium next to the tricuspid valve. It has three functions. You'll see slow conduction of electrical impulse through the AV node. It serves as a backup pacemaker if the SA node fails. It protects the ventricles from dangerously fast rates. The intrinsic rate is 40 to 60 beats per minute. So PR interval. So your PR interval uh, represents the time for the impulse to travel from the SA node to the AV node. The AV node is the gatekeeper. So you'll see your PR segment here. So the beginning of the P, beginning of the P wave to the uh, beginning of the QRS complex uh, is what you'll call your PR interval. But the normal range is 0 0.12 to 0 0.20. If you don't do anything else, put a little extra more about that and grade that in your brain to know that Normal PR interval is 0 0.1, 0 0.12 to 0 0.20. Anything greater than 0 0.20, we're heading into block territory. Okay. Uh, a lot of people think that 0 0.20 on the dot is when you would start saying, hey, that's a block. Nope, it's greater than 0 0.20. So just remember that. 
QRS complex. So we have our QRS complex. It's a QRS equals VR, uh, ventricular depolarization and contraction. The initial deflection of the QRS from the isoelectric line to the end of the QRS complex is measured from the beginning of the Q uh, wave to the end of the S wave, the J point. And normally, uh, has a duration of 0 0.04 to 0 0.12. So remember that 0 0.04 to 0 0.12, that's normal. If you start seeing anything greater than 0 0.12, you're going to different particular rhythms. And they don't test you on this test over bundle branch block, uh, but bundle branch, uh, branch uh, there's a certain criteria that I don't want to confuse you, but you could be into that territory. And we also use the QRS complex to look at, um, to try to decipher between <clears throat> junctional rhythms and idioventricular rhythms. So it's, it's uh, important to note that anything uh, 0.12 or less, that will be in junctional category. Anything greater than 0.12, that'll be in, um, that'll be in your uh, idioventricular rhythm category so that you can start to prepare as you study. Okay, ventricular conduction, um, you see the bundle of his, the right and left bundle branches, the Purkinje fibers. I'm not gonna go into all of that. That's anatomy and physiology, but I'll just tell you, the rate is 20 to 50 beats per minute. Okay, so remember we talked about this earlier, put it on paper. Um, this is most important because ECG paper is divided into large squares and, and small squares. So you'll see here you have one, two, three, four, five small squares, okay? So large squares are defined by dark lines and are five small squares high by five small squares long. So just please know that. 0 0.20, five boxes. Anything greater than five boxes, block territory. So just keep that in the back of your mind. And we talked about the small square 0 0.04. Okay, so basics of EC, EKG paper, um, five lower squares is one second. 15 lower squares is three seconds. 30 lower squares, six seconds. So whenever you're working on your unit, the monitor takes, prints you out a, a strip. Just remember that it's gonna be a six second strip. That's what we use to do our, uh, our, our daily ECG, uh, just kind of just um, interpreting those strips so that we can know what's going on with our patient. Uh, so hash marks occur every three seconds or 15 large squares, you'll see. Okay. Isoelectric line. So the isoelectric line of an E, Electrocardiogram designates the flat part of the diagram in between the P waves and T waves. It occurs when no electrical activity is occurring, impulses are too weak to be detected, and it's used as a baseline to identify changing electrical movement. The beginning of the isoelectric line following um, the QRS complex is a, visible, a visual cue of where the QRS measurements end. All right, ST segment, although the ST segment is isoelectric, the ventricles are actually contracting and the amplitude should be uh, less than 0 0.5 mm. And it's elevated or depressed is a, a hallmark sign of ischemia, CAD or M MI or STEMI. So you will see some examples here, this, the ST segment. ST segment issues. So you're not gonna be tested on this, but this is good to know. We are the Texas Heart Institute, so you should know about ST segments. So this first one, you'll see the ST uh, is elevated. And then the second one, you will see that the ST is depressed. So that's elevated and that's depressed. QT interval. 
So measuring from the beginning of the Q to the end of the T is your QT interval. It represents the total duration of electrical activity of the ventricles, normally 0 0.34 seconds to 0 0.43 seconds. So that's something to remember. You're not going to be tested on QT interval, but when you're interpreting your strips on the unit, you're expected to write the QT interval. These are the things they want to see. They want to see the PR interval, what that number looks like, QRS duration, and the QT interval when you're doing your daily strips on the unit. They want to see date, time, and your signature. Those are the things they want to see on that strip. And they put that in the patient's chart. So these five or well, six steps to properly interpret rhythms, uh, you want to always identify your P, Q, R, S, T. And a lot of times when I do remediation, a lot of people ask me, uh, where's the P wave? And they're sitting right there in front of me. So I ask them, do you know your ABCs? And they said, yes. I said, what comes before Q, Q, P? I said, okay, let's look at this strip. I want you to map out all your P's, map out your QRS, map out your T. That helps you, not being funny, but it helps you when you're taking your test. And I can tell you, a lot of people have come to me and given me hugs. I've been McDonald's trying to get something to eat. And I don't even remember half your faces. They come to me and say, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to show me how to interpret my strip. And I really appreciate it. It really helped that you really broke it down that way. And so as Shailene and Heather can tell you, with our last group, we probably had about a good 10 to 15 people who made 100% on this test because they listened to it. They listened. Those who didn't listen, they got to come back and spend some time with me. Like, not that it's bad to come back and spend time with me. I don't want you to spend time with me like that, but I want you to be successful on your test. And if you're not, then I will work closely with Shailene and Heather to, to set up some sessions to get you get you to pass your test. You won't be tested without getting some remediation. Okay. So we also want to determine regularity, uh, measure the rate. Uh, we want to also look to see, is there a P wave for every QRS? Is there a QRS for every P wave? If you start seeing that there's a P wave, but there's no QRS, that's blocks. You start seeing drop QRSs, I want you to remember blocks. Measure your PR interval. You're going to be measuring the width of your QRS complex. So those are the six things you're going to be doing to just really interpret these strips and rhythms. So here we have a strip that we're going to be identifying the P, Q, R, S, T. In this special note, we'll see this strip again on the test. So we'll put a little special little something by it so you'll remember it. So um, we'll be looking at the Q, R, S. Let's see. So that's your Q, R, S. You'll see the arrow pointing to that. That's your Q, R, S. That's your T wave. That's your P wave. Okay. So this one, the next one, of course, this same strip is in that packet, also on the test. That's the one that was on page 12 in that 50 page study packet that I told you there's three portions that everybody always miss. This is what makes and breaks them. Well, that's that strip, which is going to be on the test. So you'll see. QRS, that's your QRS. With this QRS, it has a negative deflection, which means it's pointing downwards, okay? So if you hear me say negative deflection, it's pointing downward. There's your T wave. There's your P wave. And do you see that this P wave is notched? A lot of people got confused on how to measure and um, they were very, very just confused on what to do with this particular strip. Even myself, I missed portions on the test when I first took this test. And I was like, wow, this is the hardest test I've ever taken. And then I took the test like November 2017. Then a week later, I got into this role. Okay? But I failed that first test. So I'm not perfect. So just so you know that I'm not perfect. I failed the test myself. I think I made a 72%. At the time, 75% was passed. And that was in 2017. One day I came to work and I was getting a lot of tiger ticks. People were knocking on my door. I hadn't even made to work yet. They were waiting outside of my door. I failed my test. And I'm like, well, what did you make? 75. I had remediated them. And then they took the test like on that Monday. 
and the company changed the scores. That made my job so hard. So, uh, so I was like, wow. So I really had to do a lot of more uh, remediation and just kind of make sure people know the difference between the tests and that you understand how many you can miss and what the percentage point or basically the end off score that you need for your test. Okay, so on this one, there's your QRS. This strip is on the test. T-Wave, which looks like it's kind of buried. Uh, you really can't see it, but it's buried in this. There's your P-Wave. But you'll see this on the test. All right, here's another one. You'll see this on a test uh, as well. There's your QRS. That's your T wave. And then for your P's, there's a lot of P's. This, what you see here, is a third degree hard block. That's a third degree hard block. That's a medical emergency. That's something that we don't want to wait and say, well, I'll call the doctor later. You guys like your new licenses that you got? You want to keep it? Okay. That's a medical emergency and you want to make sure you escalate it. Okay. And don't say, well, I'm a new grad. I just finished my boards and stuff. I should be okay, right? That's a third degree horn block. And you want to make sure you, uh, you let the proper doctors know about it. Okay. In particular, you, you would have to call a rapid response or a CCU fellow. Someone should know about it. Now, not all residents really know the details about heart issues. So what they'll do is they'll call the CCU fellow over or the ICU intensivist to come give them some more, like just consult with them to give them some more guidance on what to do. Um, not everyone is very comfortable with mastering this cardiovascular stuff. I wasn't very comfortable with it when I first started off as a nurse. and um, I guess you could kind of say I forced my way into it. So, but um, always seek guidance of rapid response or either call, call a doctor. This one here, step two, determining regularity. So you want to measure the distance from R wave to R wave. So when you hear me say measure your R to R intervals, you'll see this is this is your R, R wave right here. So this is P, Q, R, S, but this is your R wave. So when I say measure your R to R intervals, you should take a piece of paper and you should hash a mark for your first R wave and hash a mark for your second R wave. Take that paper and you wanna march it out to each individual, you know, like you should take that first, like if you're measuring this, and I hate to do this here because I can't really explain what I wanna explain. The first two, if I'm taking my piece of paper here and measuring these two, I'm gonna slide my paper to the second R wave and we're gonna compare it with that third R wave, those same hash marks. That's how you measure your order or interval. So the distance between the, the wave R to R should have little or no variation, less than three small boxes. Three small boxes, less than three small boxes, that's considered regular, okay? I seen one person saw, we saw just a little bit, but it was regular, so. Uh, you all know that you all know when it's irregular. So on the second one here, I would take my paper and I would measure first R wave, second R wave. I would take my paper and march it to that second R wave and see if something should be coming up here. It's not. So that tells me, wow, that's irregular. That's how you can determine whether something is a field, a field, a field is irregular. Okay. A lot of people miss it because they don't take the time to measure the order or intervals. So, so the marked distance between the first and second R wave steeples on the of the strip. Move your paper down the length of the entire strip to check the regularity and do not eyeball. I, I get a lot of tape messages coming out today. Sorry, guys. Let me try to get this. <clears throat> All 
I've muted it, but sometimes if someone sends a priority tiger text, it goes through my mute. So, so on the next one, we're going to be measuring the rates, the number of R waves uh, times 10. So we're, we're measuring the heart rate. This is the most important thing I can tell you guys uh, on this test is the heart rate. So you see here we have R waves. That's an R wave, that's an R wave, that's an R wave, that's an R wave, that's an R wave. So you count one, two, three, four, five. Now if you multiply that times 10, what is that? 50, anybody else? Okay, so that's 50, that's the heart rate. On the second one, if you measure, you're gonna get one, two, three, four, five. What's the heart rate? <clears throat> So on this test, um, a lot of people get mixed up on the heart rate. Typically with your R to R intervals that's going to be considered regular, you would do a 1500 minute, which hopefully in this PowerPoint strip it talks about, the PowerPoint presentation it talks about. But on this test, when you measure your heart rate, I want you guys to always use this count the number of heart rates and multiply it times 10 and look and see if your answer is in your answer choice. Because this test is a very flawed exam. A lot of people kind of uh, just kind of think that they should do it a different way. But which you are right, you would typically use this way if it was irregular. But this test is kind of, uh, how can I say? You know how when you think that your significant other is being faithful, but they're not being faithful? Well, this test is not going to be faithful to you. <laughs> so you have to think about that in advance. <laughs> I'm trying to make sure I word it correctly. So what I want you to do is start off measuring by using the count the number of R waves and multiply it times 10 first. And then there is another way to do this to measure it too. And I hope in this PowerPoint presentation, he talks about it. So let's see. I didn't write this. Nope, they didn't talk about that. Okay, go back. So I don't think they talked about that, but the, another way to measure this is to use the 1500 minute. Typically, if you see the order or interval is regular, you're supposed to use the 1500 method. And the way you would do that is you would take an R wave, so this R wave here, and take that R wave there, and I would count the number of small boxes in between this R wave. So I'll start here. I know that's 5, that's 10, 15, 20, 1, 2, 3. 24. So can anyone, uh, did I count the first one? Let's start over. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. 1500 divided by 29. Someone come up with that answer. Divide 1500 by 29. Tell me what you get. 51.7. 51.7. So that's how you would measure using the 1500 minute. So when you're on the unit and you're measuring your strips and your order or interval is regular, you should be using the 1500 method so that you can get the right and accurate number for your heart rate. If the R, if your order or interval is irregular and you're on a unit and you're measuring your heart rate, you should use the R wave method where you multiply the number of R waves times 10 to get your heart rate. That's the correct way to do it in reality. Okay, that I'm, sure, I'm telling you the correct way to do it when you actually get on the unit. But on this test, I want you to use the R wave method. When you multiply the number of R waves times 10 to get your heart rate. If you look in your answer choice and you don't see that answer, then I want you to use the 1500 method. Okay, all right. But just a little FYI so that you guys can know you have a practice test and the exact strip that uses the 1500 method, you have the answer choice in that, in that practice test. And you have the second one that's located in the 60 page uh, study packet, which is 52. So you shouldn't miss it. So if you come to me for remediation, I don't know who you didn't study. Could you please go over that 1500 method? Sure, sure. Okay, so I'm gonna go with the 1500 method again. So as you're using this on the unit, you'll have an idea of how to do this. So here, that's the peak of my R wave. Um, you can, I'm looking at that second R wave and I'm looking at the third R wave. 
So since I see a dark line here, I'm not going to count this first one per se. I'm just going to start here. That's 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29. So that's how I got 29. So I'll take 1,500 and divide it by 29. And that's how I know what the accurate heart rate is. Like, get it right. 34. You got 34? Or did I miscount? Let's 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. Oh, so I started here. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 26, 27, 28. And I came back and counted that one. Sure. Wouldn't the first mark be zero? So I was so I'm not counting this one per se yet. I'm going. I'm gonna. So to make it easy, I'll. I, this is the way I do it. I start off by counting my uh my lower squares. That's one lower square. So that's five, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five. Small squares: twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine. Okay. That's just to give you an idea of how to do it. So you won't. If you, if you have to ever, ever do that, you do know how. <clears throat> so is there a P wave for every QRS and a QRS for every P? So you hear, you see here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven P waves. And then here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, QRSs. So how many P waves do we have? We have seven. How many QRSs do we have? We have seven. So if you have an equal amount of each, that lets you know something's normal about it. We just need to do some further investigation, but it's pretty normal. We know it's not a block. Well, we know it's not a second degree type one or two or three. We would have to measure the PR interval just to double check to make sure it's not first degree. Or are we missing anything? No. Okay. So on this one, we have um, our strip. I'm gonna look at it. We have seven P waves. We have five QRSs. Are we missing anything? Yes, two QRS complexes are missing. This strip is going to be on the test. That's a block. <coughs> All right. What degree um, practice? So it'll confuse you as we go along. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have plenty of, to practice. If I did it now, it'll confuse everybody. Yeah. Measure the PR interval. So PR interval uh, configuration. So we'll what the, we want to look at what the length what length is the PR interval. So I just want you guys to remember that a normal is 0 0.12 to 2.0. Sorry, 0 0.20 seconds, and this is equal to one big box or five small boxes, which we talked about. You'll hear me grill this in your head. Uh, does it remain the same throughout the strip? fixed or variable. So an example of a PR interval, uh, a variable PR interval exists in second degree type one uh, blocks. So let me kind of give you an idea of what PR interval is when they say prolonged. If you see something that says prolonged, that means that you have counted that there's greater than five small, five, five small boxes, but it's consistent. That's what PR, uh, prolonged PR interval means. If you see where it's variable, that means it's greater than 0 0.20, but each box is getting longer and longer, but it's greater, that's variable. You will be asked that on the test, so you'll have an idea of the difference between prolonged and variable. So, but you wanna measure from the beginning of the P wave to the first deflection from baseline at the QRS complex. Uh, you wanna measure your uh, PR interval, let's see if I can. You want to measure the PR interval. So uh, when you're measuring your PR interval, 
you want to measure from the beginning of the P wave to the beginning of the QRS complex. So in between these lines is where you're going to get your, your uh, what this should be. So you have a line right there before the P wave and then right here. So in between here is where you would um, count the number of small boxes and multiply that times 0 0.04. That's how you get PRM. Okay. Okay. So determine the PR interval. Is it normal? You want to look at a few complexes. So a lot of people just look at one PR interval and say, oh, this is the answer. But just look at more than one so you can have a, a really good idea of what it is before you start making your decisions about your uh, interpretation. Okay, I had to mute it for a second. Give me a second. Okay, so measuring the PR interval, I had to stop for a second. Let me just, I'm sweating a little bit. So you wanna, um, when you're measuring the PR interval, you wanna determine the PR interval, is it normal? Look at a few complexes, is it seven to eight boxes uh, or 0 0.28 to 0 0.32, prolong or fix, so on this one. Okay, hey, on this one, which you'll see on the test, uh, this one is about four to seven boxes. PR interval is 0.16 to 0.28 seconds. And you have variable for your PR interval. And you wanna determine the PR interval, is it normal? And you wanna look at a few complexes. Number six, our last and final step, you're gonna be measuring the QRS complex. QRS complex, Configuration, you want to do all your QRS complexes. Do they look the same? PVCs are still QRS complexes, but they just look different. And we'll kind of talk about the PVCs a little bit in detail so that you can have a good understanding of that. A lot of people mess up on the test with the, with the PVCs. Duration, what is your QRS interval? Remember, uh, normal is 0 0.04 to 0 0.12 seconds. And this is one to uh, three small boxes. So you want to measure uh, from the beginning of the QRS complex all the way to the J point where the QRS uh, turns into the ST segment. Okay. So here we have a, a complex practice number one. So uh, remember, you're going to be measuring from the beginning of the QRS complex all the way to the J point where the QRS turns into the ST segment. So you're gonna determine your QRS duration. So uh, you have two small boxes. So if I'm measuring from about right there to there, there's there, there should be one, two boxes. So that's 0 0.08 seconds. This particular strip is on the test. Is this normal? Yes. Here we have this one, another practice strip. You'll see this one on the test as well, okay?
With this one, you have four and a half uh, small boxes, which equals 0 0.18 seconds. And then, uh, is this normal? No, it's wide. This one's particular ones on the test. And you remember I talked about the difference between junctional rhythms and idioventricular rhythms, being that the QRS is greater than 0.12, I mean 0.1, yeah, 0.12. This one is greater than 0.12, so it would be in the ido idioventricular category. And you would just need to look at the heart rate. Measure your heart rate. It comes down to the heart rate. And on this one, you have one, two, three, four, five. Heart rate is 50 on the dot. So this one is idioventricular rhythm. Same exact strip that's on the test. Sinus rhythm. Let's talk about sinus rhythms. So we'll, this PowerPoint goes off into the different categories. Now we'll talk about the sinuses uh, and all that good stuff and kind of go into detail about them. So you see we have uh, sinus rhythms, which indicates that the electrical conduction system is operated in an orderly fashion. The SA node uh, is the origin of rhythm. What makes a rhythm an arrhythmia? So if you have a heart rate below 60 or 100, of course, that's going to signify something's going on. Anything less than 60, sinus break. Anything greater than 100 is sinus tap. So sinus rhythm is between 60 to 100. PR interval less than 0.12 or greater than 0 0.20. If you see anything less than point uh, one two, you know that's in your that's probably within your junctional family. Anything greater than point two zero is in great that would be in the block family. QRS interval zero zero point zero uh, zero four uh, greater than point one two. So I'm, I think I just got confused, you guys. I just mixed up PR interval with the QRS. So um, PR did I just mix y'all up? No, just want to make sure I'm on the right track. So I just want to make sure I didn't misstate myself. PR intervals, you're looking at that when you're looking at uh, when you're looking at your block. So if it's greater than 0.20, that's that's indicates something's going on like a block. Uh, QRS less than 0 0.04 or greater than 0.12. So if you see something that's greater than 0 0.12 you want to start looking at the idioventricular rhythms to see what's going on. Anything less than 0.12, you'll be looking at junctional rhythms. Uh, your QT interval should be between 0 0.34 or greater than, uh, it shouldn't be that way, but if it's greater than 0.43, uh, usually bundle branch blocks are greater than 0.43, so, uh, but you're not tested over that. And they have a variety of complex shapes. So let's talk about this first one. This one is normal sinus rhythm. You'll see this again on the test. That was the same exact strip that was out of that 60 page study packet. This rhythm is regular. The rate is between 60 to 100. You have a P wave. And then your uh, interval is between 0.12 to 0 0.20. And your QRS measurements is, is less than 0.12 seconds. So that's what considers sinus rhythm. Sinus bradycardia. So you'll see this is that strip on the test. The rhythm is regular. Your heart rate is going to be less than 60 beats per minute. You're going to have the presence of a, of a P wave that's going to be present and upright. And the PR interval is between 0.12 to 0.20. QRS is less than 0.12. Okay. Of course, you're going to see this strip on the test. Sinus tachycardia. Rhythm is regular. Here's your heart rate, 100 to 150 beats per minute. You're going to have the presence of an upright P wave. Your PR interval is between 0.12 to 0 0.20 seconds. And then your QRS should be less than 0.12 seconds. Atrial rhythm. So atrial rhythms uh, are things like AFib, atrial uh, tachycardia. A flood that and PAC, that's in the atrial family. So atrial dysrhythmia is reflect abnormal electrical impulse formation and conduction in the atrium. Atrial kick allows ventricles to fill with about 20% more blood than would normally enter if the atrial did not contract efficiently. Gives you about 20 to 25% of cardiac output. Most atrial dysrhythmias are not life-threatening. 
Some are associated with extremely fast ventricular rates and excessively rapid heart rates may compromise cardiac output. So here we have a field. This is just regular a field. And if you guys uh, see that, can someone count the number of R rays and multiply it times 10 and tell us what that heart rate looks like? One hundred on the dot. So this is just a field. Your rhythm is going to be irregular. The atrial uh, rate, you can't determine what that is because you don't have P waves. It's non-discernible. Non-discernible. But your ventricular rate is going to be less than 100. So we just counted this. This is 100 or less. No discernible P waves. You're not going to have a PR interval. And then you're not going to have, uh, really, your QRS should be uh, less than 0.12. So, but the most... You should be focused on heart uh, rate and then knowing that you don't have a discernible P wave. That kind of helps you to decipher that. A field with rapid, rapid ventricular response. This is the one that gets everybody. Okay. A field with RVR is on version A. There are no regular A fields on version A. Version B has just one regular A field. So when you're testing, if you see A field on this A, on version A, know that it's three A fields with RVR on this test. Can someone count that heart rate for me? Tell me what the heart rate is. One seventy. Okay, so we have a heart rate of one seventy. And remember, we talked about with uh, A field with RVR heart rate. 100 to 180 would be that category. This rhythm is irregular. The atrial rate is unable to be measured, but your ventricular rate is going to be greater than 100. Uh, it's going to be a non-discernible P wave. You're not going to be able to measure the PR interval, and the QRS is less than 0.12. Okay. If the rate above 100, it is an atrial field, A field with RVR. Okay. Um, I just want to go back and talk about this A field with RVR. Just to, a reminder and write it on your paper. They are calling it atrial ventricular nodal reentry on the test so that you can make a note of that in your mind. Write it down. That's another name for that. Atrial ventricular nodal reentry tachycardia. That's another name for A. Nope, I'm getting confused, guys. Don't write that down. Sorry, I just I, I just kind of gave you guys some uh, misinformation. I'm thinking about atrial tachycardia, so don't write that down. Sorry about that. Don't write that down. Uh, my my brain is getting uh <laughs> crossed. So so please do not write that down. It's this is just a field with RBR. Sorry about that. Atrial flutter. So this, this strip is on the test, but there are some atrial flutters that's on the test that looks pretty bad. We do have one in the practice strip that we're going to go over to get you comfortable with it. Um, a field could be regular and irregular. And the strips that's on the test are a little bit confusing. So we do have a sample in the practice test that we'll talk about and get you ready for your test so you can be comfortable with it. Um, your rate is going to, if your atrial rate, it can be between 250 to 350, and uh, ventricle rates vary. Uh, you'll see a fluttered soft tooth appearance with your P waves. You're not going to be able to decipher a PR interval, and QRS is less than 0.12. Okay, this is what I was talking about. I'm getting all my atrials mixed up. Remember, I was trying to tell you to write something down, but I, I see we put it in the PowerPoint presentation. Sorry about that. This is supraventricular tachycardia, also known as atrioventricular nodal reentry tachycardia. This is the one that changed the terminology, and a lot of people didn't. Uh, all you know is SVT and atrial tach. No one knows atri atrial ventricular nodal reentry tachycardia. But I want to say it's either, I want to say I remember two questions on version A 
where they had that in the answer choice in the atrial ventricular nodal reentry. But just make sure you're counting your heart rate, measuring your order art interval to see, to make a final decision. So rhythm is going to be regular. Heart rate is 150 to 300. On this one, they have 150 to 300. From what I found in the textbooks, it can go all the way up to 350. The presence of the P wave may be hidden in the QRS or T wave, and it's usually you cannot measure the PR interval. Uh, QRS is less than 0.12. This is a fast heart rate, greater than 150 beats per minute. It's regular, okay? Uh, it's so fast you can't see the P wave sometimes. The rhythm originates above the ventricles, making the QRS complex uh, less than 0.12 seconds. So a lot of people get SVT and VTAC mixed up. VTAC, you're going to have a wide QRS. SVT, you're going to have a small, narrow QRS. So that's the difference between that. But a lot of people get this mixed up. Now we're talking about junctional. Yes, ma'am. question about SVT and VTAC is vascular RVR. So you have a question between AFib. Repeat it. A. Repeat your question, ma'am. So I have a question regarding to AFib, who is RVR, mm -hmm. and the difference between him and the SVT. AFib with R. You have a question about AFib with RVR and okay. SVT. Okay. So she has a question about AFib with RVR and SVT. Um, okay. AFib with RVR is a rapid ventricular response. That's uh, heart rate is going to be between 100 to 180 beats per minute. When you're measuring the R to R interval, you're going to see that it's irregular. That is the difference between AFib with RVR and SVT. A field with RVR has an irregular R to R rhythm. And SVT has a regular R to R interval. So you will see here rhythm irregular. And let me just kind of go to SVT, rhythm regular. That, that's how you decipher it. But I'm glad you asked that question. That is a good question because a lot of people mix up A field with RVR and SVT on the test. It comes down to your R to R interval. And a lot of people try to go through the test and don't even measure the R to R intervals. Uh, you know, they want to just show off their skills and then they're, they're coming back to me. So measure your R to R intervals. But that, that was a good question. All right. So now we'll talk about our junctional rhythms. Any other questions before we move on to the next one? Okay. Do y'all have some questions back there about the uh, difference between the SVT and uh, APL and RBR? The main difference is that the um, SVT is regular. Yes. That's the main difference. The main difference between, and I hope you guys can hear me, the main difference between AFib with RVR and SVT, AFib is irregular, SVT is regular. Out of all those rhythms on that tip sheet that I gave you, AFib is the only one that's irregular. On the little tip sheet, the quick tip sheet, those are, those are the most missed questions on the test. So uh, junctional rhythms. So on this slide here, you'll see, you see we have normal P wave from SA node, inverted P wave from AV node, no P wave, retrograde uh, P wave from AV node. Uh, as I mentioned on the test, with the P waves for the junctional rhythms, they were all absent. I didn't see any retrograde P waves. I didn't see any inverted P waves. But I just do want you to know that in junctional rhythms, you can have these type of P waves. But on the test, 
all the P ways were absent. Every last one of them. That'll help you to decipher because you some people was like, well, is it retrograde? Is it inverted? You have enough to worry about with trying to make sure you pass this test. None of the P ways on the test uh, were inverted or retrograde. It was just no P wave. It was just the absent P wave. But you can have these different P waves in a junctional rhythm. So you do need to know that. Okay, any questions about this P waves with the junctional rhythm category? No questions about that? All right. So here we have junctional rhythm. Same exact script is going to be on the test. Junctionals, they're all the junctional rhythm categories, they're all R to R intervals of rhythm. With this one, the heart rate is 40 to 60 beats per minute. Uh, and it tells you it can be inverted or absent. But what I've noticed on the test, all P waves were absent with junction. PR interval 0 0.12 if present and the QRS less than 0.12. Regular rhythm, no P waves, could be inverted P waves or retrograde P waves in lead two. Uh, they originate above the ventricles, which means the QRS complex is narrow, 0.12 seconds or less. Accelerated junctional. So this particular strip, I don't think is on the test, but this is a good one just to kind of give you an idea of what it looks like. Regular rhythm, heart rate between 60 to 100. So if you see the heart rate 60 on the dot, that's not accelerated. It has to be 61 and above, okay? This is just a range. Um, P wave could be inverted or absent. On the test, all the P waves that I saw in the junctional categories were absent. PR interval less than 0.12. QRS measurements less than 0.12. One, two seconds. Junctional tachycardia. This is the same strip from that packet. It's going to be the same strip that's on the test. Uh, go back on this one. Okay. We talked about this earlier. That is a T wave. That's a T wave. I'm pointing at it. That's a T wave. This is no P wave. So I have no P wave QRS and I got a T wave. No P wave QRS and I have a little humpback T wave here. And I think from one student, one student uh, during the last cohort, he was confused by this because he thought this looked like a P wave because the way this is kind of hunched up like that, he thought that was a, uh, a T wave. So and we had two sessions, and he really was caught up on this being a, a P wave. So I explained to him, I know you want that to be a P wave, but when you take your test, convert that to a T wave, and answer this as Joshua Tech Cardi, because this exact strip is on the test. Everybody misses this. The rhythm is regular. Heart rate greater than 100, but less than 150, could be inverted or absent. PR interval 0 0.12, QRS less than 0.12 seconds. So this is just a general comparison of your rhythms. Junctional rhythms, 40 to 60 beats per minute. If it's 60 on the dot, that's junctional. Accelerated junctional rhythm, 60 to 100. It has to be 61 and above in order to be in this category. If it's 100 on the dot, that's accelerated junctional. Junctional tachycardia, 100 to 150 beats per minute. If you see that the heart rate is 100, do not choose junctional. Go with accelerated. They, they, they have two questions on the test. Heart rate is 100. And they give you these two in the category, and everybody goes with this one. It has to be one on one and above in order for you to say this is junctional tach. Any questions regarding uh, the junctional rhythm comparison? No questions, everybody feel comfortable with the junctionals and kind of how to decipher between those with the heart rates? Okay. Ventricular rhythm. So with your ventricular rhythms, the impulses start somewhere in the ventricles and all QRS complexes will be wide which means they'll be greater than 0.12 seconds or greater than three small boxes. 
Here we have idioventricular rhythm. Idioventricular rhythms are lethal rhythms. So for those of you working in the ICUs and you have a patient that converts to this, just know that's a lethal rhythm and you need to escalate that. This strip is on the test. I repeat, this strip is on the test. The rhythm is regular. The heart rate is between 20 to 50 beats per minute. So if it's 50 beats on the dots, that is ventricular rhythm. One, two, three, four, five. Heart rate is 50. There's no presence of a P wave. PR interval, you don't have it. QRS is less than 0.1, well, it's greater than 0.12. Greater than 0.12. This is the key point to remember with ventricular rhythms. The QRS is greater than 0.12 and a lot of people get kind of confused by that. So I'm gonna take this QRS here and we're gonna measure it. So I will put like a little hash mark right there and a hash mark right there. And I'm gonna count in between. That's one, two, three, four, five. Five times 0 0.04 is what? 0 0.20 seconds. If the QRS is greater than 0 0.12, that's automatically in the idioventricular family. You have RR intervals, regular, no P waves or presence, originating the ventricles, which means the QRS complex is uh, wide and greater than 0 0.12, uh, 0.12 seconds. Here we have accelerated idioventricular. This is also a lethal rhythm. So don't say, well, I didn't know it was important. Accelerated idioventricular rhythms are lethal. Um, this is regular. This strip is on the test. The R to R interval is regular. If you count the heart rate, count your heart rate and tell me what you get. Heart rate is what? 80 beats per minute. And then anywhere between, anything between 50 to 100, if it's greater than 51, if it's, not, if it's 50 on the dot, that's idioventricular. If it's 51 and above, then that's accelerated. You don't see a P wave. There's no intervals to really measure, but your QRS is 0.12 seconds. So a lot of people get this one confused with junctional, um, uh, they get this one confused with accelerated uh, junctional. When you first start off measuring these, some of these are 0.12. Toward the end of this strip, the PR interval 0.16. So the range for this is 0.12 to 0.16. And a lot of people answer this accelerated junction, but this is accelerated idioventricular because the first part of this started off as 0.12. Toward the end, it got to 0.16. Let me see if, see if I can find that one. So I can start right here measuring and probably end about right there. So if I count one, two, three. So that's three. Start right there. Start right there. One, two, three. I'm trying to find the one that's 0.16. One of these is 0.16. Not sure which one it is, but a lot of people miss this one. So just make a special note by this one that this is accelerating any of ventricular so that you won't miss it. Okay, VTAC. VTAC lethal rhythm. There's nothing to, to really tell you about that. This is one of those ones that you can't just sit back and sit down with your piece of paper and say, okay, that person's dying and you sit back measuring trying to figure it out. You don't have time for that, especially if it's pulseless VTAC. You need to immediately recognize their rhythm and get your crash cord and you got to start your initiating advanced cardiac life support or basic life support, whatever you need to do to get that patient shocked out their rhythm. So this is VTAC and you see we have QRSs, T's, your J point, this is a lethal rhythm. Your rhythm for this is usually regular. So if I was to take a piece of paper and try to hash it out and measure these QRSs, I'm gonna have an R to R interval that's regular. 
My heart rate is going to be greater than 100. There's not going to be a P wave. Can't measure the interval. And the QRS is greater than 0.12 seconds. So let me tell you what I'm seeing people do on this test and they're making a mistake with this. Okay, so this is VTAC. What people are doing, they're calling it SVT. And they tell me, well, the heart rate was greater, it was 200. I want you to look at the QRS. The QRS is greater than 0.12 and it's wide and bizarre. It's a wide and bizarre QRS. That's what decipher VTAC from SVT. With SVT, your rhythm is coming so fast that you have a narrow QRS. Your QRS is less than 0.12. So that is the difference between SVT and VTAC. It comes down to the measurement of the QRS. VTAC, wide and bizarre QRS. SVT, narrow QRS. That's going to help you decipher. Another issue that I'm seeing on the test, a lot of people mix up VTAC with VFIL. And it was, it's gotta be VFIL. The difference between VTAC and VFIL comes down to the order or interval. VTAC is regular. VFIL, irregular order or interval. That's the difference. Okay, so here we have types of VTAC. These are the two types of VTAC that we have, monomorphic and polymorphic. So let me kind of get you to see the difference between the two, okay? So here are our QRSs. I want you guys to look at each one of these QRSs and compare them to each other. They all look alike. So mono looks the same. The QRS looks exactly alike. Look at polymorphic. Compare those QRSs to each other. They all look different, right? So mono looks the same. Poly looks different. Monomorphic VTAC will be on the test. I like that. Not that it's extra, but monomorphic VTAC will be on the test. Polymorphic VTAC is not on the test. B field. Lethal rhythm. So with B field, you don't have time to sit back and say, well, let me look at the strip and sorry, sir, just hang on, don't die yet. Let me look at this strip and try to interpret what you what, what you're going through. With VFib and VTAC, those rhythms are so lethal that you need to be able to recognize that with the naked eye. You don't have time to interpret and try to take a piece of paper and measure. That's a rhythm that you need to get the crash court, put your uh, quick combo pads on, and we need to be shocked. Okay? There's no way to get around it. There's no way you can just sit there and try to interpret. I'm going to try to interpret. Give me a few seconds. You don't have that time. With VFib, R to R interval is chaotic. You cannot measure it. It's very chaotic. But a lot of people still get these VTAC and VFIL mixed up. You're not able really to determine a rate. Can't figure out what the PR, P wave, there's, there's no way to determine a P wave. There's not an interval. Sometimes there's not a QRS measure. Let's talk about the types of B field, because there are some other types. We have coarse B field, and then we have fine B field. So here we have this V field here. If I tried to measure this with a blank sheet of paper and tried to measure the order or interval, it's going to be irregular. It's greater than three mm, so that means so we have this box right here, right? One, two, three, four, five. So it's greater than five. This one here is like greater than. It's it's really high. So that's how you know the difference between coarse, fine is usually less than three. Coarse V field is on the test. Coarse V field is on the test. 
this is the exact the exact strip that's on the test. So if you come to me for remediation and you missed that, that tells me you didn't study. Course V field is on the test. This is the exact same strip. Special note in the answer choices, they will include fine in there. And a lot of people are choosing fine. Fine V field is not on the test. So do not choose that. Course V field is on the test. This is the exact same strip. Please do not come to me if you haven't missed this. Okay. Okay. Let's talk about premature complexes. All right, so premature complexes, these are beats that, uh, that come in before the next anticipated cardiac cycle, okay? We have PACs, and they originate in the atria. They're the hardest to identify, but it looks like an early sinus beat. We have an upright P wave and a narrow QRS. PJCs, which is not on the test, but you need to still know about it in case you're on a unit and you're trying to figure out what that looks like, but this is what it looks like. It originates in the AV junction. Uh, no P wave, inverted or retrograde P waves. It's narrow QRS. PVCs, they originate in the ventricle. Looks like the elephant in the room. And there are no P waves, but the, there's a wide QRS. And is this uh, the underlying? You're going to always list your underlying rhythms first for like all your PACs, PJCs, and PVC. So what that means is you have heart rate of 60 and you, and you know, you have that one PAC. Well, that's just sinus rhythm with PAC. Okay. Or if you have PJC and the heart rate is 55, that's just sinus Brady with PJC. Yes, ma'am. What does PJC stand for? PJC stands for premature junctional contraction. Okay, so I'm going to go over these uh, first three again. PACs, premature atrial contraction. PACs, premature atrial contraction. PJCs, premature junctional contraction. PVCs, premature ventricular contractions. All right. So here we have premature atrial contraction. And by the way, this is the same strip that you'll see on the test. So as you can see, our first P wave here, that's a normal P wave. That first P wave is a normal P wave. Compare that P wave morphology to the rest of the P wave morphology. Point out the P waves that don't look right. This is normal, but compare it to the rest. Tell me which number, number P wave, number two, three, or four, or five, which ones look abnormal? Anyone uh, to guess? Three, five, six. You said three, five, six. Okay, you said three, five. And six. Anyone else? Two and four. Okay. So here, there's a P, the P wave morphology changes, and it changes there. Right. Then if this back to normal, look at that. If this back to normal, then here we go again. Those look a little bit different. That flips back to normal. So premature uh, atrial contractions, that P wave morphology changes. You'll see this on the test. Um, I'm just going to just Stop sharing for just a second. I want you to see a quick little video about the, uh, there's a video that I want you guys to see regarding, uh, we're on page 67. So I'm gonna come back to that in just a yeah. second.
And there's a video that I want you guys to understand the um, premature uh, atrial contractions. Uh huh. Yes, go ahead. You can take. So we're going to take a break, guys. We're going to take a break. So if you need to use the restroom, go ahead.
Okay, everybody, I hope you guys enjoyed your break. We're going to go ahead and get back started with the uh, DKG. So we left off talking about premature atrial contractions. I'm going to show you a, a YouTube video that will kind of help bring some uh, clarity to premature atrial contractions. Okay, so what's the criteria we use to interpret a PAC on our ECG tracing? Well, the P stands for premature, which means the complex is going to come prior to the next expected beat. So as you're marching out your R waves, this will come before the next expected complex. It's premature. It's a PAC atrium, but not sinus. So this impulse is originating somewhere in the atrial chamber, but not from the sinus node. It's taking a different pathway because it's coming from a different area thus creating a different shaped P wave. The morphology will be different. It'll always be upright, but it may be a little flattened and it's not gonna look like a regular sinus P wave. Now, because the PAC has really no impact on ventricular conduction, the QRS should be narrow, less than 0.12, and honestly, it should look like all the other QRSs within that strip. So the big takeaway, comes premature, the P wave looks different. It has a P wave, but it looks different. The QRS remains the same. And that's the criteria to determine a PAC on your ECG tracing. I'm Mark, thanks for watching. See you in the next video. Okay, so that just kind of gave you an idea of what you're looking at when you're looking at premature atrial contractions you're looking at the P wave morphology. That's, that's how you're gonna be able to determine um, what's happening with that. We go back to our um, presentation. Okay, so here we are looking at our PAC, and now that you've watched that video, can you look at that and determine where the premature atrial contractions are at now? Does it make sense? The, morph the morphology looks different. So uh, with this, you're going to have an irregular R to R with premature atrial contractions. If you have a premature atrial contraction, the R to R is the only thing that's going to be abnormal about this in that premature atrial contraction. Your rate is going to be probably either 60 to 100, or it could be sinus brady, but that's not a, you, you see sinus brady every day in sinus uh, tech. And that's sinus tech, but sinus brady is sinus rhythm. Your P wave is going to be present or hidden in the T wave. Your PR interval is going to be normal. Your QRS is going to be normal. You're just going to have the, the uh, P wave morphology that looks different. This is normal P wave. And look at that one. That looks different. That looks different. So P wave uh, morphology changes when you're looking at premature atrial contraction. Here we have premature ventricular contractions. That's a little bit different. Remember we talked about QRS is ventricles, right? So everything here is normal up until you get here. That is a PVC. That's my PVC and that's my T wave. This is a premature ventricular contraction. This strip you will see on the test. This is the same strip that came out of that packet, that 60 page packet that I told you guys about. Rhythm is gonna be irregular because you have a PVC and you'll use your underlying rhythm to determine what that underlying rhythm is. In the, the prophecy package, that they consider this sinus tech, they say sinus tech with a rare PVC, but this is what that is. So now we're gonna talk about PVC group. On the test, you'll see 
bigeminy and trigeminy. You need to be able to decipher between the two. A lot of people have trouble with bigeminy and trigeminy. So bigeminy is simply every second beat, there's a PVC. So let's look at this first strip here. This first beat, that's a, that's a P wave. So we'll have a P wave right here, QRS, this T wave is inverted. Now we're looking in lead two. When I come here, I see that I have a PVC. That is a PVC. That's a T wave. Here's a P wave, QRS, T, PVC, T wave. P wave, QRS, T, PVC, T wave. So you can simply say this first beat is a normal beat because it has a P, Q, R, S, and T. This second beat, I don't have a P wave because I have a premature ventricular contraction. So I have a PVC and a T wave. So this is a PVC. So beat one is normal. Beat two is abnormal. Beat one is normal. Beat two is abnormal. When you see a PVC that falls on every second beat, that's by Gemini. That's by Gemini. On this test, they kind of changed the, the terminology of, they used to call it bigeminy PVC. Now they're calling it ventricular bigeminy. So if I wanted to count this heart rate on this, I'm gonna count all my regular R waves here, right? In addition, I'm going to count my PVCs. So I'm gonna count this to get the heart rate. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10 times 10 is what? 100. So is that sinus rhythm or sinus tap? Sinus rhythm. So this is sinus rhythm with ventricular bigeminy. That's, how it's, it's, that's an easy, simple way just to break it down so you can really understand the difference because a lot of people mix up bigeminy and trigeminy on the test. Here we have ventricular trigeminy. Take special note of this particular strip. It is on the test. This strip is on the test. So here I have a P wave. That's a QRS and that's a T. P wave, QRS, T. And here's a PVC. This PVC, you can see it's upright. It has a positive deflection. The first one had a negative deflection, but this is positive. That's my T wave right there. I have a P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, PVC, T wave, P, Q, R, S, T, P, Q, R, S, T, PVC, T wave, P, Q, R, S, T. So with this one, Beat one was normal, beat two was normal, but beat three is was abnormal. Beat one, beat two, beat three abnormal. A PVC that occurs every third beat is trigeminy. That's trigeminy. So I'm going to count my heart rate. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10 times 10 is 100. So this is sinus rhythm with ventricular trigeminy. So whenever you have a PVC, you always have to have an underlying rhythm, okay? You can't just say, oh, it's a PVC. You're gonna wanna know the underlying rhythm because sometimes that can help you, uh, the doctors decipher what type of treatment plan to, to initiate with your patients. Okay. So when interpreting the rhythm strips, describe- Hold on a second, Katerina, we have a question. Okay. What I understand about crematorial complexes, you know- Come up here so she can hear you. What I understand about crematorial complexes, Okay, again, she can't hear you. Don't talk until you get up here. <laughs> you have her to come in here so she can ask the question. Yeah, you wanna go next door? Okay. She's right inside the door. Okay. 
Okay. So ask your question and ask it loud so everybody else can oh, Okay. So what I was saying is usually what I understand from what I've read, mm -hmm. I know you don't count the premature um, either A12 or, or premature uh, ventricles. You don't count them when you have to, when you want to know the rate mm -hmm. or when you want to calculate the rhythm. Mm -hmm. Usually because it's premature, like, you know, it's not mm -hmm. no proper um, electrical conduction in the heart. So mm -hmm. you don't you don't basically count them and say, yeah, these are the real um, sinus reading or whatever it is. So I think that that's 70, not 100. So what she's asking, um, the PVC is not adding. I'm counting these PVCs. Yeah. Uh, no, one. <clears throat> yes. So that's a one. Yeah. No. So no. you wouldn't count that? No, you wouldn't count You wouldn't count that? Yeah. And you would just count these. Exactly. So she's asking a question. Her question was about counting the, uh, to get that heart rate, we're counting uh, this PVC. So PVC is still PRS, right? And the PVC is wide and bizarre. On the test, and when you're on those units and stuff, and you're counting your heart rate, and you have a PVC. You you need to count the you need with the PVCs. You need to count the wide and bizarre PVCs with that to get your heart rate. Yes, ma'am. Right? We're counting. We're counting. Uh, we're talking about not a pulse that you're taking. We're talking well, about on a strip. It will correlate, though, right? Yeah, yes, it will correlate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you would count, and in, in, in the beginning of this, of this uh, presentation, and let me see if I can go back and, uh, let's see. Uh, so I can kind of show you what I'm talking about. Give me a second. So we were on page 68. I figure out where it was it in here that we talked about the form of the county. Um, <laughs> So I'm looking for the uh, in this PowerPoint presentation where they, where they talk where they talk to you about counting the heart rate. Uh, on this test and, and the way they have you take this test for this test, they look at the uh, PVCs and that's the way we've been teaching to count the, the PVCs uh, as a form of your heart rate so that you can pass this test. You don't have to, but <laughs> this is a very difficult test. But on this test, they they use the they use the PVCs to to determine, like this one, we're counting that to get our heart rate. Okay, we're looking at that, and you're counting that abnormal PVC in that as an R wave to ca calculate your heart rate. Okay. 
okay, for this test so that you can pass. Okay, so um, when interpreting the rhythm strip, describe the basic underlying first, then add the additional formation. So here, you see this is this beat here is abnormal, but you want to also look at your underlying rhythm. So you should be uh, include here we go include the PVC as a beat when calculating the heart rate for irregular rhythms. I didn't make this up. I'm just following the rules, and they've had a, when they developed this PowerPoint presentation, they went to all 17 hospitals and one educator from each hospital volunteered to work on this PowerPoint presentation and looked at numerous references on how you should do this. So when you're interpreting your strips and you have a PVC, you're going to calculate that abnormal beat in that heart rate. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Heart rate is 70. Sinus rhythm with PVC. I didn't make the rules up. I didn't make this PowerPoint. But all the educators in our division that came to a conclusion that this is the, the PowerPoint presentation that we're going to go with, and this is how you're going to interpret your rhythms, and this is how you're going to calculate your heart rate. Okay. Any any questions? No. Other important rhythms. Should I talk to y'all about this? <laughs> this one, uh, asystole, lethal rhythm. So of course, if you go in your patient room, as I've seen this before, you see them sitting up watching TV and you have mm -hmm. asystole on the uh, telemetry monitor, check your leads, okay? Because sometimes the leads, I've, seen, I've had that happen to me. So always check your lead so it, it, it kind of match up that condition with that patient. But if you see that patient's unconscious and, and they're blue and you have this rhythm, then most likely it's asystole. You want to make sure that you store CPR and call your code blue. So this is a lethal rhythm. You're not going to have any electrical activity. Uh, the rate is absent. Everything is absent. There's nothing much I can tell you about that. There's no way you can just say, well, I guess I got to sit back and let me, let me try to interpret the strip. That's, those are, this is one of those rhythms that if you look at it and you see it, you have to know what you're looking at when you see it. And you have to initiate emergency, uh, your, your hospital's emergency, which is a cold blue for our system. We should all be, if we walk in the room and we see this is happening, you should be pressing there's an emergency button in every room, every hospital, you should press that button and you should start CPR. If you don't walk, run out of the room and wander into the hallway and ask for help, you should be starting chest compressions because everyone is basic life support uh, certified. Any questions about the asystole? No questions? Okay, so let's talk about pace rhythms. These are the same exact strips that's in that packet. And everybody misses it. Please don't, if you don't do anything else and you can give me my birthday gift early, please get these two right, okay? That'll be my gift. If you get those two right, do not get those wrong. If you see two spikes, so we have a spike here right before for our P wave. Anything before P wave, P wave equals atrial. So that's an atrial pacing spike. Here's a P wave, right? here's a uh, QRS and there's a spike right there. This is atrial ventricular pacing. There's nothing to, to second guess about this. They're not giving you any hard pacemaker rhythms, like failure to pace and all that stuff. You don't have that. It's just simply atrial ventricular pacing. You, you see two spikes, uh, just choose AV pace, even if you're not that strong in telemetry. You see, to just remember, she said, if I see two spikes, choose AV pace. Okay, keep it simple. Then you have your ventricular pacing. One spike here is right before your QRS and there's a T wave. You don't necessarily see a P wave in this. There's no P wave. So this is just simply ventricular pacing. There's one spike. That's it. And this is what you're going to see on the test. These exact same strips are on the test. 
So we got to talk about our worst telemetry strips we'll probably encounter, the blocks, okay? The blocks are the worst of the worst. And uh, we'll try to figure out how to get through this with the blocks. So atrial ventricular blocks or AKA hard blocks. The term hard block is used to describe arrhythmias in which there is a delayed or failed conduction of electrical impulses through the AV node into the ventricles. The PR segment represents the AV node on ECG and is important in determining the type of AV block. We have our most easiest block, first degree hard block. So if you measure this order or interval, you're gonna get a regular order or interval. Heart rate is usually gonna be between 60 to 100 beats per minute. You're gonna have a present and upright P wave with every QRS that you see here. All your P waves are present and upright. The only thing that's abnormal with this is the PR interval is greater than 0 0.20 and is fixed. QRS is normal. This is the only thing that's abnormal with the first degree hard block. This. Regular rhythm, no drop QRS complexes. PR interval is the same length, fixed. You're going to name the underlying rhythm first, either sinus rhythm or sinus bradycardia. Any questions about first degree hard block? That's pretty much our simple and easy. So all our P's are conducted. It just takes a little longer than it should. Now just remember, this strip is on the test. Let's talk about this one. This is second degree block type one. Now, a lot of people like the Mobus one and Winky Beck. On the test, they just simply just, they just use second degree type one. A lot of people get confused when they start saying Mobus one, Mobus two, Winky Beck, and all, they, they, they even confuse me. So on that tip sheet, I just kind of narrowed it down second degree type one and second degree type two. Keep it simple because you'll confuse yourself. You'll confuse yourself that you won't even understand. And then some people come to my office and talk to me, Winky Beck, Mobus, they confuse me. And I've been doing this for over 22 years. I'm like, just say second degree type one or second degree type two. And I just want you guys to make sure you really have a good understanding of this so that you can pass your test because that's what we want. Okay. So with this one, of course, you're going to have an irregular order or interval. Heart rate could be between 60 to 100 beats per minute. You're going to have a present and upright uh, P wave. And it's going to be progressively getting longer until a, a QRS drops going to be varying and it's going to be less than 0.12 seconds. Irregular rhythm, drop QRS complex, PR interval changes. It's going to be variable. You have a question? Yeah, so are we not counting this as heart rate 50? So what is your heart rate? Heart rate is, is 50 on the dot? Okay. Now, this is criteria they pulled from somewhere, but on the test, uh, what I've been seeing, anything that was third degree was uh, less than 50. Anything 50 and above was, you could you, you had your second degree type one and two to, to, to decipher this one. So, but this is just a strip they use for this presentation. So a lot of the tips that I've given you guys is because I remediated over 100, 100 people, probably 300, a lot. And I've seen the common mistakes in, uh, just to try to help you get through this test and navigate through it. But what I've seen, uh, if it's above 50, uh, you can go with your second degree type one and two. So in this, this particular case, the heart rate is one, two, three, four, five. But you have your PR interval. You have a P, QRS, T, P, QRS, T, P, QRS, T. Here's a P. But there's a drop B. Here's another P, QRST, P, QRST. So we have one drop B here. We already know that our heart rate is 50, so we're not going to even look at third degree heart block. But we do know this. 
we know that it can't be first degree hard block because first degree hard block doesn't have any dropped QRSs. So we do know that if we measure this, this PR interval, you see it's here, we have that. You would take your paper and you would put a hash mark there for that beginning of the PR interval and put a second hash mark on that paper for the ending of that PR interval. You would take that paper and then you would bring it and put it, place it right there to compare it. And you'll see that this is stretching out. That's getting longer. And you'll come here, you'll see it's longer. And that goes back to like that first one there. And it gets longer. That's second degree type one. The PR interval is inconsistent and you have dropped QRS. Here we have second degree hard block type two. Some people call it MOBIS two, but like I say, you'll get yourself so confused if you start saying MOBIS two, winky back, da da da. Second degree type one, second degree type two, and keep it simple. So on this one, uh, PQRST, 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 P dropped QRS. We have a dropped QRS. That's PQRST, 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 PQRST. So you see, we have our dropped QRS. So we are automatically know it can't be a first degree hard block because it's a dropped QRS. And let's look at our heart rate. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Heart rate is 70. We already know that it can't be a third degree hard block, right? So in this case, we're down to second degree type one and two. Then you're gonna be measuring by taking a piece of paper and you're gonna make a hash mark on that paper for, for where that PR interval is gonna begin and a little hash mark for where that PR interval is gonna end. You're gonna take that paper and, and kind of just put it in place of this to see if it lines up. If it continues to line up and it's consistent, PR interval is consistent, that will be considered second degree hard block type too because it's consistent. So you see, Heart rate is a rhythm, usually irregular. Heart rate is less than 60, but this one is, look, 70. Present and upright, PR interval could be normal, but fixed, but you have drop beats, or it could be greater than 0 0.20, so it can go either or. You can have a PR interval that's 0 0.20 on a dot, but you have drop QRS that would make it second degree type, type two. Or you can have PR intervals that's what seven boxes, and it's each one of them is seven boxes, and you have a drop beat. It still would be classified as second degree type two, because second degree type two, the PR interval is consistent. That's the key word consistency. So you have consistent, and then QRS is normal. So irregular rhythms. Dropped QRS complex, PR interval is the same myth, it's fixed. But we know all P's are not conducted because here we determined that we had a missing QRS. Third degree hard block, our lethal rhythm. Okay, so on this one, this comes straight out of the text, that little uh, 60 page uh, packet. And I wanna tell you something about this one so that you can make sure you, you really studied this particular strip. You remember on the tip sheet, I told you if the third degree hard block was 50 or less, it would be third degree. This is that one exception. What is the heart rate on this one? 50. This is the only third degree hard block on version A that's exactly 50. This is the one that comes out of that textbook. Ask me, because I just took my test. I've, I've uh, got all my things right except for that one. Took it like three weeks ago. And I was like, wow. So I'm gonna warn you, this is the, the exception to the norm. This is the only one that the heart rate is exactly 50 beats per minute on the dot. This is the exact same strip that's in that packet. 
okay? So our heart rate is 50 on this. Now remember, I did tell you on my tip sheet, if you see it was 50 or less, then it's, it's third degree heart block, but it's less than 50. But this particular third degree heart block is 50 on the dot. This is the only one that's 50 for the heart rate on the dot, okay? So your R to R is gonna be regular and the P to P is regular. You have a regular atrial. P's are present and upright. There's no relationship between these P's and QRS and the uh, uh, QRS measurements varies. Regular rhythm, more P's than QRS and the pure interval varies. And no, the P's are not, for the, no P's are conducted on this one. This uh, recap, This recap is a good recap to look at to make sure you really have a good understanding with your uh, blocks. And what I do is I've taken this out of this PowerPoint presentation and I use that for my remediation because so many people have problems with blocks. There are 10 hard blocks on version A, 10. 10 hard blocks on version A. So let's go back over this recap. Remember we talked about sinus, uh, well, first degree hard block. There are no drop QRSs. If you can, as you can see, we have one P wave for every QRS. Let's see, P, QRS, T, P, QRS, T, P, QRS, T, P, QRS, T, P, QRS, T. These are each eight boxes. So five boxes is 0 0.20. If it's greater than five boxes, that means it's prolonged. These are consistent. So that's what makes this first degree hard block. Okay. Now let's go here and look at second degree type one and two. Second degree type one, you have PQRST, PQRST, PQRST. Here's a P, but then we're missing a QRS. P. QRST, P, QRST, P, and we're missing a QRS, P, QRST. So I have two drop beats, two drop beats within this strip. But look at my boxes. Look at the PR interval. Six boxes, nine boxes, 11 boxes, six boxes, 10 boxes. So you see the PR interval is inconsistent. So the key things to know about second degree type one dropped QRS complexes, and PRI is inconsistent. So now we're going to look at second degree hard block type 2, P, QRS, T, P, QRS, T, P, QRS, T, P, I have a drop B. P, I have another drop B. P, QRS, T, Here's my T wave. P, drop B, P, QRS. So with this one, I have exactly six boxes. And I have drop beats. The key thing to know about this one, of course, we know it has QRS that's dropped, but it's consistent PR interval. That is the difference between second degree type one and two. Second degree type one is inconsistent. Second degree type two is inconsistent with the PR intervals. The, on the test, when they give you a strip, they like to put in the answer choice, they always make sure they put second degree type one and two in there to confuse you. So when you get to the test, you just need to measure your PR interval. See how many boxes it is. See if it's consistent or inconsistent so you can make your decision, okay? Third degree, on your third degree or block, you have P waves and QRSs that don't have a relationship. They're fighting each other. They're going to, this. I mean, it's like a husband and wife, they're together, but then they're not together. Like, look at the P waves. So you have some P waves that are marching in. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight P waves. And we have how many QRSs? One, two, three. AP waves versus three QRSs. Is that a relationship? 
There's no relationship with that. Baby. So, and what's the heartbreak? 30. So that's what makes this a third degree heart block because you have that heart rate of 30 and um, you, you don't, the conduction pattern has changed. You, don't, you that piece is marching through your QRS and that's dangerous. And that's why what makes third degree your most lethal rhythm outside of VTAC, VFib, and A system. With third degree heart block, you can't say, okay, well, let's see what we're gonna do. Let's look at your, you don't have time to, to, to do anything, but get the crash cart, get your quick combo pad so that you can put those on and do transcutaneous pacing. You're not gonna even make it to the cath lab with a heart rate like this. I've had a patient who had third degree heart block and it was on a weekend. And uh, I, I, I was like, okay, we got to call in all the on-call people for the cath lab. So I, I finally got the crash court and the nurses was like, well, you gotta wait until the, the cath lab people come in. <laughs> I said, we don't have time for that. <laughs> and they was like, what are you doing? I said, I'm putting on the, 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 the pads and I'm going to go ahead and uh, start initiating uh, transcutaneous pacing. And they was like, you can't do that. I said, well, talk to me about it later. I'll do whatever you do. So I put those pads on and I uh, set the uh, defibrillator to do the transcutaneous pacing. And I made phone calls later. But our policy guided me because we had a protocol that I followed. You're following a protocol. You don't have to like, okay, let me call and see if they're gonna wake up and answer the phone. It was I was working night shift. It was in the middle of the night. I needed to do transcutaneous pacing. You know what time the, the cath lab got there? They didn't even come. They was like, well, we're, we're gonna he gonna be first case in the morning. <laughs> so with this lethal rhythm, you need to make sure you make the right decisions for your patient. Okay. Okay. So now we're gonna practice. So here you have on this, uh, some practice questions. So uh, this one, we just wanna know the heart rate. Count the number of R waves, multiply times 10, and tell me what you guys think. Y'all don't have this? Hmm? Oh, the answer's there. Okay, well, we'll just go through it together. I mean, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So with this one, the heart rate is 90. Okay, on this one, now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Heart rate is 80. Sorry. Heart rate is 80. So all of these practice strips that you see, all of these practice strips that you see are test questions. So when people come to me and say, oh, I didn't do well on the test, and they be in my office crying, and I guess they want me to give them a hug, and I don't know if I should prepare them a bottle. I, did you study? Yeah, I looked at some stuff online. So did you study the stuff that we gave you in orientation? No, I didn't think to look at that. Okay, so let's let's look at the heart rate. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We don't see 70 in this one, right? This is one of the ones that you would have to use the 1500 method. Repeat which one, ma'am? Yes, yes. That's that's that. This one, they're asking me if why it looks like it's seventy, and seventy is not in the answer choice. This one is sixty-five. So let's. This one is the one. It's on the test. The answer sixty-five, but this is the one that you would have to use the fifteen hundred method. Remember I said count the number of small boxes in between an order or interval, then divided by 1500 to get your answer. This is the one that would do, do the 1500 method, yeah. And remember I told you this test is kind of like the significant, significant other that's cheating on you. They tell you they really not cheating on you, but they are. This, this is one of those heart rate questions. 
this is there are two heart rate questions on version A, two on version A, where they ask you the heart rate, and it's going to be using the 1500 method. This is one of them. This is one of them. And then there's another one. There's another one. It's in that packet that with all those different questions, and, it, and, and the heart rate is 52. So it's two of them. One is 65. And one is 52. Those are the only two that use the 1500 method. The other ones were the R wave method, if that helps. Okay. So let's talk about this one. Uh, this PR interval is 0.1. Six, but this is on the test. This strip is on the test, but they're not asking you the PR interval. They're asking you the rhythm interpretation. This one is a block. Uh, who said it? Raise your hand. Who, who just said the answer? You're correct. That's second degree type two. So write that down if that'll help you because that's on the test. With this one, this one is exactly on the test. And a lot of people uh, kind of just pick 0.24 because that's the highest amount. But this one is variable. It varies. Hmm? Yeah. It's not, yeah, it, this one is variable. This exact strip is on the test with that answer. This is X strip is on the test. It's on the test. Yeah, it's on the test just like that. And that's your answer. Mm -hmm. And some people come to me and say, well, I just, did you, did you study? Did you look at this stuff? No. I think some people just like to come and visit me, but that's okay. You can come visit me. I don't mind. <laughs> okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, so this one, calculate that heart rate. There's no P waves. There's no P waves on that. No P wave, QRS, and it looks like a T. No P wave, QRS. What did you get for your heart rate? 140. Okay, that's right. And our, our order or interval is regular. And we don't have a P wave, so that would classify as junctional tachycardia. So this is X strip is on the test with that same exact answer, with those same exact answer choices, which no one ever pays attention to. But you look and see what they did. Remember the four or five ones I told you to pay, pay attention to because they like to interchange those and people get those mixed up? Look what they put in the answer choices. Sign is tag. A field with RVR. SVT. Do you see how people can get this confused? If you don't know that criteria, that's why you need to really pay attention to your tip sheet. Does it make sense? Now you see how you can be easily tricked? So we have one P wave for every QRS. There's no drop beats in this. There's no drop beats. So what is our heart rate? Six. So we know it, we know it can't be sinus bradycardia, correct? So we can eliminate that. Accelerated junctional. Could have could have been accelerated junctional. Do, do we have yeah. P wave? Do you see no, P waves? Yeah. Yeah. So it can be accelerated junctional. Sinus rhythm. We already said our heart rate was 70. So if you see sinus rhythm and then you see sinus rhythm with first degree AV block, if you see anything with AV block, I want you to automatically say, hmm, let me measure my PR interval. Oh, that's the first thing I want you to think, PR interval. What is it? Is it greater than five boxes? Because if it's greater than five boxes, you're automatically going to know, wow, this has got to be a first degree whole block. So if I'm measuring, starting right here, right, if, right there on that line, and I'm going to end it right there. Let's count. So that's five, 
six, seven. That's seven boxes. Seven times 0, 0.04 is what? 0. 0.28. So this is greater than 0. 0.20. So I should automatically say to myself, this can't be sinus rhythm because the normal range is 0. 0.12 to what? 0. 0.20. So that's how you'd be able to decipher this. Here's another one. Look at your heart rate. What's your heart rate? One eighty. What's the normal range for sinus tachycardia? One one hundred to one fifty. What's the normal range for junctional tach? Junctional tachycardia. One hundred to what? One fifty. You can look. Go back. That's why I want you to write your tips down so you won't mix up your numbers. A field. What's the range? 60 to what? Just regular A field. Not A field with RVR. What's your heart rate range? 60 to 100. So this heart rate was 180, but you see how they actually, they put sinus tech in there, junctional tech. Then they stuck A field in there. I want you to pay attention to those answer choices so when you're making a decision, you won't get them confused. They love to put A field with RVR, then they'll stick A field there. That should be a a red flag. As soon as you see A field with RVR and A field, you should a red flag should go off in your mind. Hmm, they're trying to trick me. What's my heart rate? Then they add sinus tech and junctional tech, and that's to really get you get you stirred up and say, "Wow, sinus tech and it could be that." But your heart rate is 180. Sinus tech and junctional tech caps out at 150. Okay. Here we go with the next one. We're saying the P, uh, QRS is uh, 0.10. So um, I don't remember this being a QRS question per se, but this strip is on the test and it's interpretation. This strip does not have a P wave. There's no P waves, but our heart rate is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, nine, heart rate 90, PR interval is less than 0.12. Accelerated junction. So you'll see this on the test, but it's accelerated junction. Okay. So, of course, this QRS complex is 0.16, but they're not going to ask you a question about the QRS complex. This strip is on the test, but it's um, someone has to answer. There's no P wave, and the heart rate is above. The heart rate is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's in the idioventricular family. This is accelerated idioventricular because the heart rate is greater than um, 50. A idioventricular heart rate is 20 to 50 beats per minute. Accelerated is 50 to 100. So, but this strip is on the test. Accelerated uh, idioventricular. Uh, okay. So these additional things you can use to help you. Uh, it could help you. But the best thing that's going to help you to help with this test is to uh, all the strips that I identified in this packet that would be on the test study that. Then we have 23 practice questions. What time do we have? Hmm? You have 23, you have a, a practice test? Can you pull that out? So everyone should have a practice test to pull out. Let me try to find it so we can uh, pull it up. But I want you guys to start working on that practice test. Is 
we're gonna pull it out. We're gonna talk about this practice test so I can kind of give you some uh some type of guidance on this. Yes, ma'am. I'm gonna answer that in a second. I'm gonna pull it up. Let me give, give me a second. I'm gonna pull it up so that everybody can, as I'm talking about this, that the group next door can um still have um not show more. Share screen. Okay. Everybody can see this. Can you make it larger? Okay. So everybody see this, you have a practice test. This is version A, version A, the easier version. And there are 23 questions. And then you should have the answers with that that you've been provided. But we're gonna go through this and, and you know go through it together and practice it together. These 23 questions, every last one of them are on the test. But guess what? <laughs> Guess what? No one ever looks at it. No one ever looks at it. No one ever looks at it. They come to me for the second attempt. So, so we're 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 going to uh we're going to work these together. We're going to work these together, and then uh for those of you next door, if you have uh you need additional assistance, you can come in here so that I can give you some guidance. So we're gonna go ahead and work on question number one together. Okay. So let's work on question number one together. We have three, it's almost four o'clock. I think we're gonna go over our time. Do y'all wanna work on this together? Yes. Okay. Okay. So here we see there's no P wave. We have a QRS and then here's a T, it looks hump, but there's no P wave. What's the heart rate? 140. We don't have a P wave, but we have a heart rate of 140. What do you think the answer is? Because they put all those ones I told you about that they all like to mix up together. You said junctional tech. Anybody else have any other objections? Any other objections? Okay. This is the one that's in the packet. It's on the test. It's junctional tech. But as you can see, they threw a lot of stuff to kind of throw you off. Ventricular tech, A field with RVR, sinus tech. So the answer for this is junctional tech. Okay, so here we have the next one. You can see. We're measuring the PR interval. So that means you're going to be looking at your P wave here, you're going to put a little hash mark right before that P starts and right where that ends so that you can get your PR interval. <clears throat> Some people said B is in boy. Any other, any other answer choices? Is everybody in agreement with B is in, in boy? So that is 0 0.16 B is in boy. Here we have our next one, number three. I'm trying to fix it where you guys can see it and it makes sense. Okay, so we have, um, in the beginning, we have uh, three normal beats. So what we can do is these normal beats, we can take that and do the 1500 method to get our heart rate. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna come here and say, okay, this is my R wave, that's my R wave. I'm going to count the number of small boxes that's in between these R to R intervals. Five, 10, 
11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 1500 divided by 17. Okay, so someone said 88.2. So we have a heart rate of 88 ish. So let's sign this rhythm. We got the first half of this. What does this look like to you guys? The wide and bizarre QRS. What is it? SVT. You say SVT and somebody else said VTAC? Okay. So this is sinus rhythm going into VTAC. So your answer is, is uh, B. B is in boy. B is in boy. Hey, so this next one we see here, number four, we're measuring the QRS duration. And when you're looking at your QRS duration, you want to measure right there and end it about right there. Gonna start about right there and end about right there. A is an apple. Okay. <clears throat> so with this one, guys, this one is A is an apple. I even got this wrong, but the answer is 0 0.08, and you will see it on the test. Okay, so this, let's talk about this one, number five. So you have this same strip is going to be used twice on the test. This strip, I repeat, will be used twice on the test. They will ask you a heart rate question. And then they're going to ask you a rhythm interpretation question for the same strip. So let's talk about the heart rate. So this is a P wave. That's QRS. That's a T. P, QRS, T. So I need you to count the heart rate using the R, R waves. Multiply times 10. Tell me what you get for your heart rate. 130. 130. Okay. We've identified that it has a P wave. There's one P wave for every QRS. We've said the heart rate is 130. So what is the interpreted rhythm? It has a P wave, heart rate is 130. The R to R interval is regular. Everything about this is normal except for the heart rate. Sinus tachycardia. The sinus tachycardia because the sinus tachycardia heart rate is between 100 to 150. There is a P wave. There are no drop beats. The order or interval is regular. So this is sinus tachycardia. This is another most missed question on the test. A lot of people think this is atrial flutter. Okay. This will be on the test twice. One for heart rate and the other one for uh, rhythm interpretation. Let's talk about this one. What's the heart rate? The heart rate is 80. There's no P waves on this one. What is our QRS duration? We start right there and end about right there. This is the one that I told you about is between 0.12 to 0.16. A lot of people start choosing accelerated junctional, but this is D, accelerated idioventricular. D is in, in dog, accelerated idioventricular. This comes straight out of that little packet, but a lot of people misses this on the test. Here we go. I'm not going to even tell you what this is. So Y'all better not get this one wrong. What's the answer? Somebody, somebody said A. Who said A? <laughs> C. Let's 
So someone said A, but I'm gonna forgive you for that one. See this spike right here, right before the QRS? There's a T wave. There's no P wave. So this one is C, V paste, V paste. This is the one number eight. It's on page 35 in the little study packet that everyone misses the PR interval. No one gets it right. So a lot of people try to measure this. So when you see a PVC, don't measure anything there. So you should be measuring PR interval starting about right there and ending about right there. So we start about right there. So that's one. For the PR interval, okay. Let's start about right there, right there. And right there. So one, two, three, four. Four times 0 0.04 equals 0 0.16. That's your answer. Where did you start at? Okay. You said this was uh, in the packet? It's in the packet. What page? Page 35. Mm -hmm. 0 0.16. Please don't miss that. Here's our next one. I told you you will see again on a test. This strip, this strip here, you're going to see it twice. They're going to ask you a QRS duration question, and then they're going to ask you a rhythm interpretation question. PR interval, uh, the QRS duration on this one, that's 0.12. That's 0.16. But neither one of those are in the answer choice. Okay? But the answer is A is an apple. I even got it wrong. So with this one, it's going to be also interpretation question. You have a heart rate of 20, and you have a lot of P waves and not enough QRSs. There is no relationship there, but your heart rate is 20. Who said it? Some third degree heart block? Raise your hand if you said third degree heart block. That person back there in the back, raise your hand. That's correct. Third degree horn block. Okay, you see how this is tricky. Look at the look at the answer choices. They threw everything in there. That's a throw you out. Count that horn rate. Just count the horn rate. Tell me what the horn rate is. What's the horn rate? Horn rate is 180. One, two, three, Heart rate 180. I need to know if my art art interval is regular or irregular. It's regular. Okay. So since I have a regular order art interval and my heart rate is 180. So we do see a fib in there. A fib with RBR. We're going to go ahead and scratch that out because it has to be irregular. So we're scratching that out. Heart rate is 180. So size tech goes from 100 to 150. We can scratch that out. VTAC and a atrial ventricular nodal reentry. What are we going to go with? You're down to C and D. Who's going with D as in dog? Raise your hand. That's correct. Okay, so we have our. Uh, Number 11, count your heart rate, count your heart rate. T tell me what you get for your heart rate. One ninety, one ninety. Okay, do we have one ninety in our answer choice? Yeah. That's the answer, one ninety. Okay. Here we go. Count the heart rate. That's correct. At least you guys remember. Okay, good job. 65. 
No one should miss this one. Number AB Pace. What did you guys say? AB Pace. Raise your hand if you agree with AB Pace. Thank you. It's AB Pace. So this one is B is in boy AB Pace. Do not miss this one. AB Pace. There's two spikes. Okay. Number 14. QRS duration. Okay, raise your hand if you're going going with B as in boy. Okay, raise your hand if you're going with C as in cat. Okay, so the answer is B as in boy. I would have would have would have went with zero point zero four, but they go with zero zero point zero six is the best answer here. So, yeah. Okay, number fifteen. Let's go to that one. So on this one, guys, there's no P wave. What's the heart rate? 100 on the dot, right? So there's no P wave. So we know it's not normal sinus rhythm, but we know it's not sinus tech because they both have P waves. We're down to B and D. Who's going with junctional? Okay, those are my junctional folks. Who's going with accelerated junctional? Okay, just you. Okay, so what's the heart rate again? 100. So anyone who answered accelerated junctional got it right. Good job. Accelerated junctional because the heart rate is 100. 62, 100. If the heart rate goes above 100, then you then your junctional tag. Okay. Okay, so number 16, number 16 is that, you know, I told you about the three most missed questions in that packet that everybody missed. Here we go. This is PR interval. What do you think it is? Someone said B is in boy or D is in dog? B is in boy, okay. Any other answers? C is in cat. Okay. C is in cat. Who else? Any? D is in dog. Okay, so we have one right answer. If you answered D is in dog, you got it right. That is the most missed question on the test. D is in dog. Good job. No one ever gets this one right. So make sure when you study that you remember that you got it wrong so that you can get it right on the test. I don't either. And when you take your test, <laughs> but just remember when you take your test, that's the most missed question. And a lot of people that decides whether they pass the test or not. So please, please get it. Please. I mean, you know, like they miss all three for that one strip. So. Just try to uh, remember to uh, remember that that's the one that's tricky, very tricky. So this one, let's talk about this one. This, that's a P wave, QRS. T wave is like hiding somewhere. P, QRS, P, QRS. So you need to uh, identify the PR interval. So if you look right here, you're gonna start your PR interval right there and you're gonna end it right there. So if you can count, count the number of boxes, small boxes, multiply times 0 0.04 and just tell me what you think the answer is. You say 20, okay. Who got 12? Okay, 12. Y'all got 12, okay, any other answer? 12, okay. What'd you get, 12? 20. Okay, the answer for this one is B is in boy 0 0.12. Okay, here we are with the next question. So look at the answer choices. Look, look at the answer choices. Then go back and look at the rhythm and then tell me what you think it is. 
Support. Raise your hand if you think it's C. Okay, any other, okay. Oh, any other answer choices anybody else think? So if you answer C as in cat, you got it right. That is course B field. Here we have a heart rate question. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you got it 52, then you got it right. Those are the two questions upon the test that they use the 1500 method. It's in this practice question. So you shouldn't you shouldn't come visit me and say, well, I, you know, I, I decided not to answer 52. I wanted to try something different. Please don't do that. Okay. So the next one, remember I told you this one in that packet, page 12, the three most missed questions. A lot of people misinterpret that. This is a NOSH P wave. So you have a P, QRS, that's a T wave. P, QRS, that's a T wave. P, QRS, that's a T wave. So there's a P wave. Could it be idioventricular? No. Nope. Could it be junctional rhythm? No. Nope. Could it be sinus bradycardia? Yes. yes. So who else going with, with uh, C sinus bradycardia? Okay. Who else going, who going with D normal sinus rhythm? So this one is C is in cat, sinus bradycardia. All right. Let's see. I'm gonna, so. I've already have answers so already being spit out. So this one, yes, this is the one I told you that is gonna be on the test. You see that you have a trend every other, every third beat PVC. So this is B as in boy, sinus rhythm with ventricular trigeminy. Okay. Because you have a heart rate of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Heart rate is 100. So this is sinus rhythm with ventricular trigeminy. Uh, it was sinus rhythm with ventricular trigeminy. So number 22, what's the heart rate? 40. Good job. 40. A is in apple. 23. D or B? D is in dog or B is in, in ball? D is in dog or B is in ball? D is in dog? Someone said B. Everybody else agree with a B? No, that's the CR and then what was the most. Okay. If you if you agree with Sinus Brady Cordia, raise your hand. Okay, if you agree with Sinus Brady Cordia with first degree A block, raise your hand. The answer is D. Is in, in dog sinus bradycardia with a first degree AV block. Your PR interval is greater than 0 0.20. Okay, so guys, this is it. We're done. Thank you. All right, so I hope this has been helpful. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and log out now. Have a great day.